I'm E.G. Marshall. Welcome to the world of your over-self. What is the man talking about? Over-self? What's that? Well, you might say it's that part of you where your imagination resides. The truth is that, according to any number of religionists, you don't exist at all. Only your imagination. When you refer to myself, you are actually talking about an illusion created by your overself. Confusing? Certainly is to me. And it was more than confusing to Amanda Phillips. You are not a ghost, Morley? Of course not, Amanda. Oh, I dare say you would call me a ghost, but ghosts don't really exist. They're people. They simply live on a different plane of existence. I don't know what to say. But then don't say anything. That's the trouble with people on your plane. They say too much. But these different planes of existence... Morley, it's confusing. I simply don't understand. You will, my darling. You will. If you dare. Our mystery drama, Picture on a Wall, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by George Lothar and stars Diane Baker. I'll be back shortly with Act One. No, I didn't say you don't exist, that you are not really yourself. Those who devote lifetimes to the study of what we are and why we are here, who try to understand God and our relation to him, I'm talking, of course, of priests, ministers, Buddhist monks, even philosophers. They say it. They say that the self is your conscious, the over-self, your subconscious, and the super-self, your unconscious. You understand? If you do, you're far more knowledgeable than I am because I don't understand at all. And as I said earlier on, neither did Amanda Phillips. Well, here it is, Amanda. Hope you like it. Gil Franklin, it's beautiful. I figured it would grab you, even though you did say you wanted to live in Greenwich Village. <laughs> yes, I did. All my life in Gladesville, Iowa, I've yearned to be an actress living in Greenwich Village. But this, it's its so lovely. Wh who, what? May I come in? Oh, Mrs. Broly, of course. Let me introduce you. Amanda Phillips, rising young star of the Broadway theater, or soon to be anyway, Mrs. Broly, landlady. Delighted to meet you, dear. Is uh, everything all right? Oh, it couldn't be more so. I never expected to find anything as, well, really enchanting as, as this. <laughs> Not at what I can afford to pay anyhow. It is only $45 a week, isn't it? Uh, yes. How can you afford to let it go at that? A place like this, furnished so nicely, those beautiful paintings on the walls, especially that big one over the fireplace, and the garden. You can walk straight from this room into the garden. It's just lovely. I should think you could rent this for two or three times what you're asking. Uh, perhaps so, but... Yeah, well, you see, dear, I'm not only extremely old, but I'm extremely particular about whom I rent to. And as your fiancé will tell you... Uh, Mr. Franklin isn't my fiancé, Mrs. Broly. Oh, 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 I thought... I uh, have hopes, Mrs. Broly. High hopes. Well, now, you're such a nice man. I hope you realize them. Because certainly Miss Phillips is a most attractive and desirable... Uh, something wrong, Miss Phillips? That... Smell. Smell? Aroma, I, I should say. A, a scent. The, the scent of lavender. Why, it's a cologne I use. Yes, a cologne. Lavender. Now, uh, if there's anything I can do to help you get settled in, dear, anything you need, you just pick up the telephone. Uh, just to, 
pick it up? It connects to a switchboard. I'll answer. Well, make yourselves comfortable. Strange. What? The smell of lavender. I didn't smell it until at least several minutes after she came in here. And another thing, it seemed to come from that direction, out there in the garden. And Gil... Yes? She's gone, but the scent, it's stronger. You're imagining things. I don't smell anything. And no, I don't have a cold. Very strange. Look, I've got to get back to the office or the law firm of Belding and Maxwell will be firing their youngest partner. But I'll see you for dinner tonight, okay? Very okay. Pick you up at seven. Well, better unpack my bag, put things away. That scent, it is, it must be coming from the garden. Locked and no key. Yes, Miss Phillips. Uh, Mrs. Broly, the French doors into the garden, they're locked. Yes, dear. I keep them locked. You do? For your protection. You see, anyone who wanted to could get over the fence around the garden and, well, an ounce of prevention, you know. Yes, but I want to uh, use the garden. <laughs> what I can see... Through the French doors, it's it's enchanting, that fountain. The fountain doesn't work, I'm sorry to say. Hasn't in years. Even so, it'd be a nice place to sit. Those stone benches and everything. Would you bring me the key, please? Why, uh, well, yes, if I can find it. Find it? I'm not quite sure what I did with it, but don't you worry now. I'll do what I can to find it. I certainly shall. Well, I never. I just never. Never what, madam? Who? What? Who are you? Norcross is my name. Morley Norcross. Do please forgive me. I had absolutely no intention of startling you. I turn around to find you leaning casually against the French doors. The open French doors. And you... How? How did you get here? Over the fence, you might say. And how did you open those locked doors? I didn't find them locked. Well, I did. Well, perhaps it's one of those knobs. You can open them from one side, but not the other. Let's have a look, shall we? I'd rather not, if you don't mind. Oh, I'm sorry. You're angry with me. I've offended you, Amanda. You know my name. Tit for tat. You know mine. But you told me yours. Then it's altogether possible that that rather huge label on your luggage told me yours. <laughs> <laughs> of course. See? For a moment, I... Well, you won't believe it, but I thought you might be some kind of, of ghost or something. I believe it. Might I have the pleasure of showing you your garden? If you will step through your French doors into your garden, then, Miss Phillips, you can all... Be Smell fall in the air. And uh, lavender. Uh, yet I, I, I don't see any in the garden. My cologne, I dare say. You use lavender cologne? Yeah, old-fashioned, isn't it? For, for a man, I mean. Why, p perhaps, but uh, I like it, Mr. Renaud. Well, I say call me Morley. If we're going to be friends, that is. And I hope we are. Do you? <laughs> Why not? Why not, indeed? Beautiful fountain, isn't it? <laughs> yes. Yes, it's beautiful. It's simple. A peasant girl holding a tilted pitcher on her shoulder. A pitcher from which the water used to pour into that large stone basin at her feet. Used to? Sixty years ago or so, yes. Sixty? Well, how do you know that? Oh, uh, how... how do I... Uh... Well, yes. You can't be more than... Uh... Oh, 40, say? Thank you. Thank you, my dear. So how would you know that this fountain hasn't, uh, uh fountained in more than, uh, 60 years? 16 years, I said. 16. And, well, I know because I once lived where you're about to live. In that service flat, uh, living room and kitchenette? Mm-hmm. Well, what did you do? <laughs> uh, what kind of work? I was a dramatic coach. You don't mean it. 
A dramatic coat? An excellent one, I might say. Uh, would you... Um, well, I hardly dare ask this, but... Uh, uh, would you coach me? Of course. I fully intended to. You? Yes. Oh, now, Mr. Norcross. Morley. Morley. Well, you might have got my name off the luggage label, but but you couldn't you couldn't possibly know that I, I want to be an actress. No? No. <laughs> what is it? Ever read Sherlock Holmes stories? No. That's too bad. They're fascinating. Fascinating. Holmes could look at someone he'd never seen in all his life before and tell him everything about himself. I was an avid reader of Holmes, and somehow I picked up the technique. For example... Your makeup. Oh, what about it? Unless I'm mistaken, on your cheeks, that's panistic rosy glow, isn't it? <laughs> yes. And a touch of daylight orange in the corner of each eye. You're amazing. Of course, on stage, you'd use vermilion. But for daytime wear, you're most astute. And then, of course, your clothes are a dead giveaway. To say nothing, my dear, nothing of your walk. Unbelievable, Morley. My elementary what? Elementary. <laughs> Would you like some tea? Do you have any? I mean, you've all just moved in. In my suitcase. Then I'd love it. Come along inside. No, 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 I'll, I'll sit here. I'll, I'll sit here. It's such a, a pleasant afternoon. I'll be as quick as I can. Yes? Come in. Oh, Mrs. Brawley. Found the key to the French doors, my dear. Well, thank you. Though I am not sure I'll need them now. Oh, I'm glad you've decided to leave them locked. Much safer. But I haven't decided to leave them locked. As you can see, the doors are... Oh. As I can see what? Uh, closed. I didn't close them. And if Morley had, I'd have... I'd have heard him. Morley? Did you say... Morley? Uh, Mr. Morley Norcross. <laughs> He's sitting in the garden by the fountain. There's no one sitting in the garden, Miss Phillips. No one? Why? He's gone. And the door's locked. Of course. Why? Are you looking at me like that, Mrs. Bowley? Miss Phillips, finding this key put a very old woman to considerable trouble. Now, I don't mind that. I'm accustomed to it and delighted to make my tenants as comfortable as possible. But I don't like having games played on me, Miss Phillips. I don't enjoy being made a fool of. There are the keys you ask for. Please take care to lock those doors before retiring at night. But Mrs. Brawley... Amanda, you were dead tired, beat. You probably stretched out on that couch to rest and got off to sleep. You dreamed it all. You had to. I... Uh, I don't remember lying down, Gil. I... I didn't. I started to unpack and... And then... The scent of lavender came to me even stronger than before. It came from the garden... I tried to go into the garden, but found the doors locked. And so I called Mrs. Brody. Yes, yes, you told me all this. But, sweetheart, it couldn't have happened. It just couldn't. Well, if, if it didn't... Oh, I don't know. I just don't know. And neither do I. One thing I do know, though. I'm taking you off for the best dinner you ever had. You need it. <laughs> I guess I do. Won't be a minute. Put on a new face. Okay. Know something? What? I did all right by you, finding this place. Comfortable, homey. Even the paintings on the wall. Not the usual crummy stuff you find in a place like this. And pretty good art. This one over the fireplace is a knockout. I haven't had a chance to look at it, really. It's by, uh... I don't know, some name here at the bottom. Can't, can't make it out. Dated... No, I can make that out. 1909. It's called the Dramatic Coach. Oh? Shows him the coach teaching a girl how to act. Very handsome guy. Mm, tall, wavy chestnut hair, worn kind of long. Blue eyes, I think. 
Gray at the temples, strong nose. Very strong nose. Oh. Ready so soon? Let me see that. The painting? Yes, the... Huh? Amanda, what is it? The man in the painting. The dramatic coach, Gill. That's Morley Norcross. Well, we may be talking about the self, the over-self, and the super-self... But so far as I'm concerned, Morley Norcross is a ghost. Now, maybe he isn't. Only my opinion. But the things going on in that Ninth Street flat, the things that happened to Amanda in that garden, you ask me, they're more than strange. They're uncanny. I wouldn't be concerned, except I remember Amanda saying she felt scared. I don't like that. It worries me. I'll be back shortly for Act Two. We're involved with an experience having to do with the occult, the esoteric. Or rather, lovely young Amanda Phillips is. As we know, she has come to New York City from Gladesville, Iowa, hopefully to become a successful actress. One can expect all sorts of things to happen to one in the Big Apple, of course. But what has already happened to Amanda on her first day is, well, uh, to say the least, odd. The man in the painting is Norcross? The man you think you met out there in the garden? Gil, I know you think I'm spaced out. No, no, I just think you dreamed it all. I fell asleep and dreamed. Dreamed? About a man who was the living image of the man in that picture? A dramatic coach to boot? Well, it figures, doesn't it? What do you mean, it figures? Well, there he is in the painting. The painting is, is titled The Dramatic Coach. Your eyes may have just glanced at it, but your brain, it, it registered you clearly. You were tired, worn out from your trip, you stretched out to rest, fell asleep, and voila. Dreamed of the man in the painting. The man who said he was a dramatic coach. Hmm. Well, I don't remember falling asleep. But uh, what you say makes sense. That's what must have happened, I guess. Sure. And speaking of getting rest, young lady, you've had a long, tiring day, so uh, I'm going to split. Oh, it's only 10 o'clock, Gil. You don't have to... No, 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 you're tired. And now that I've got you here in New York, you uh, you can count on seeing a lot of me, if you want to. Oh, of course I want to. You sound as if you really mean that, Amanda. Oh, Gil. Sweetheart, you know how I feel about you. It's just that... It's the great white way beckons. It's a career on Broadway or nothing. <laughs> no, a career on Broadway or marriage and kids. Oh, Gil, darling. Look, I've, I've got to try it first. I've got to satisfy myself that I've, I've got talent or I haven't. That I can make it or I can't. That Look, I, I, I've just got to have my chance. Be patient, please. For you, I'll outdo the patience of Job. Good night, honey. Good night, my darling. Oh, I am tired. Into bed, Ethel Barrymore Phillips. What? Lavender. The scent of lavender again. From the garden. He's there. Sitting by the fountain. And I'm not sleeping. Not dreaming. Oh, locked. Morley? Amanda. What are you doing here at this hour? Ah, it's such a beautiful evening. Full white moon. Yes. Isn't it an enchantment? The jet black buildings tall against the night sky. Lights shining yellow and orange and windows here and there. And here. Right here in the midst of it all. A small oasis of peace and quiet loveliness. <laughs> you keep talking like that, Morley, and you will cast a spell over me. I will, won't I? Amanda, do you mind my coming here of an evening now and then? I won't, if you say no. Well, no, I... I, I suppose it's all right. You come when you want to. Thank you, my dear. Thank you. Morley... Yes. There's a painting over the fireplace. It's, it's called The Dramatic Coach. And 
the man in the painting, the coach, looks exactly like you. Yes. Yes, he does. It was painted by Scott Costain in 1909. The man in the painting is my grandfather, whose name was also Morley Norcross. Oh. Uh, you didn't... I, I, you didn't think... Yeah, I'm afraid I did. No, you couldn't have. <laughs> but, look, if you haven't lived here in 16 years, you said? Yes, 16. Well, what's the painting doing there now? <laughs> you have no doubt heard of actors being forced to leave their luggage behind because of non-payment of rent. <laughs> and you? Oh, Morley. Well, it's quite all right about it. It's quite all right, especially since I can look at it almost as much as I want to. I can take a peek now and then through the French doors. You poor man. You love that painting, don't you? You're very perceptive. Yes, I do love it. As much as I love this fountain. The fountain? Yes. Did Mrs. Broly tell you? No, no. I don't suppose she did. There's a legend goes along with this fountain. A legend? It's rather tragic. All the better. <laughs> the more romantic. Perhaps. A man, someone who lived in that flat where you live now, as I lived, a man committed suicide at this very spot. Oh, no. Why? I think the phrase of the time was unrequited love. Oh, Oh, Morley, that is romantic. It didn't seem so then. What? I mean, to say, the man must have felt the very depths of misery, experienced the most frightful emotional horrors to kill himself. He committed the greatest sin known to man, or God. Suicide. No, 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 no. Despair. And in despairing, renounced his faith in God. No one who believes in God truly believes can ever give way to despair. Amanda, you remember that. Yes, Morley, I shall. As for the legend, the fountain ran red with blood, his blood. And then it stopped flowing, just stopped. They tried to get it flowing again and again, but they have failed every time. According to the legend, it never will flow again until... Until? Until someone, somewhere, sometime, does something so supremely unselfish, so totally and completely selfless that the sin of suicide committed here is paid for. Beautiful. Beautiful. And when that happens, if ever it does, the fountain will gush forth once more. Um... I was wondering... Yes? Would you have any objection if I came in? Well, only for a moment. To have a closer look at that painting. <laughs> Why, of course not. Come along. Thank you, Amanda. Your grandfather, was uh, he a dramatic coach, too? Or did he just uh, pose for No, you? no, no. He coached actors and actresses just as I do. Well, there it is. Yes, there it is. Amazing, the resemblance. Isn't it? <laughs> Isn't it? Was your grandfather, was, was, well, was he the man who uh, killed himself in the garden? Yes, yes. And she, the girl in the painting. Oh, he loved her. He loved her. And she loved him. Or so she let him believe. She was one of his pupils. Beautiful. Talented. I can't tell you how beautiful. How talented. Oh, I shouldn't think you could, since you weren't born yet. Yes. Yes, that's, that's quite true. Quite true. It's only hearsay. Well, what happened? Well, she began to get rather good parts and began to be known. And, well, she met a wealthy man and fell in love with him. Or some said his money. Oh, dear. It must have been tragic. It was more than I could bear. You? Oh, uh, my, 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 my grandfather, of course. Uh, but but you, you said more than you could bear. My imagination. I have a flair, I have a talent for placing myself in a situation of becoming uh, the people uh, involved. I imagine myself. Well, you've played the game called imagination, of course. No, I, I've never even heard of it. Well, it's a wonderful game. And incidentally, extremely helpful 
to an actor or actress. Would you care to play it? Well, I... Well, let's do. Now, <laughs> let's imagine ourselves to be, well, those, those two people in the painting. All right. How do we go about it? First, look closely at the painting. Mm-hmm. Try to see every detail. Every detail. For instance, the furniture. Old-fashioned. High-backed couch with brocaded upholstery and anima That's right. And the table lamps, beaded lamps they call them, I think. That's right, that's right. And the gas jets on the walls. Notice? How could I help but notice? I feel as if those lamps are actually lit. As if the gas jets are really glowing, as if I... Yes, yes, yes. I'm in the room with him... His arms around me, his lips close to mine. God. It's all so real. I am that woman in the painting. You are, you are. You have become her. You have become Iris Jordan. Iris Jordan? That was her name. Is her name because you bring it to life again. Iris. Oh, Iris. 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 No, no. What Iris, are you doing? darling. Let Iris. me go. I love you. I love you. Molly. Mr. Norcross. Please, Iris. Unhand me, sir. Iris. You hear me, sir? Unhand me. Please. I told you I no longer love you. I love another, Thomas Broly, and I'm going to marry him. Don't do this to me, Iris. I beg you. Miss Phillips. I beg you. Open the door. I can't bear it. I can't bear it. Miss Phillips. I'll kill myself. Do you hear me? I'll kill myself. Miss Phillips. Miss Phillips. What? Is... Why were you crying out like that? We... I guess I... I got carried away, but... But we were only playing a game. A game? We? Molly Norcross and... Why? He's not here. Mrs. Broly? Broly? Is your first name... Iris? Oh. Oh, what if it is? Are you... Were you the girl in that painting? I... Well, you know, I, I... I I think you're out of your mind. You were the girl in that painting, weren't you? You were an actress. And you were in love with Morley Norcross, but you jilted him for a man named Broly. Thomas Broly. Miss Phillips, I will ask you to vacate these premises in the morning. This room, that garden, they're haunted, aren't they? I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, yes, you do. Not only the room and the garden, but that painting, all haunted by the ghost of Morley Norcross, the man you loved and then jilted more than 60 years ago. I, I... That's why you rent this place so cheaply. $45 a week. Tenants just don't stay here very long, do they? How long has it been since the last tenant, Mrs. Broly? How long? Well, more than a year. I see. <laughs> What happened to the last tenant? Dead. Found dead in the garden. She'd been strangled. And that's why you weren't able to rent the place? No. The tenant before... Found dead? Strangled? Yes, I... Oh, my dear child, I only pretended to be angry with you and demanded you to leave to... To save your life after letting me rent the place. I hope the haunting was over, but I see now it isn't. Morley's ghost will haunt this place, haunt me till the moment I die. You must go in the morning. No. No. I'm not afraid of ghosts, Mrs. Broly. But more than that, I don't want to leave. Don't ask me why. I don't know. I'm afraid I do. What? Because you've done what I'm almost sure the others did. They couldn't bring themselves to leave either. And they didn't know why. Nor did I then. But I think I'm beginning to know that. You've fallen in love with Morley Norcross, Miss Phillips. You've fallen in love with a ghost. Well. There's a twist for you. Has Amanda fallen in love with the ghost of Morley Norcross? Or is some other power, some other force at work? Let's not forget that we've been talking about not ghosts, 
but the baffling, the mysterious complexities of the human mind. I'll return shortly with Act Three. with a ghost. That surely must be a curious experience, to say nothing of a dangerous one, especially when, if previous tenants of Amanda's little apartment did the same thing, they were strangled to death as a result. But why? Morley Norcross, his ghost, that is, seems a charming, gentle, anything but violent spirit. So why? Amanda certainly has no answer. As for Gil, the man who hopes to marry her... I just don't quite believe it. This story of yours of what happened here last night... True, Gil, every word of it. You can check it out if you want to. You're a lawyer. Go to police headquarters or wherever you go. Find out if two women were strangled here or not. If you believe all this, what are you staying here for? Mrs. Broly says... thinks... (laughs) I've fallen in love with Morley... (laughs) Now I've heard everything. You in love with a ghost. Amanda, you don't think you are, do you? If you think that, then you need help, sweetie. You need help in a bad way. No, you're telling me I'm crazy. Well, if you're not, you certainly sound it. I think you better go, Gil. Now, wait a minute. Please, Gil. I take time off from the office to come down here and drive you to a tryout. Your first audition for a Broadway play, and now you tell me to get lost. I'm sorry, but you get me so upset, so angry with you, and... We've never quarreled like this before. Never. Sweetheart, I'm sorry. I really am. Now, come on now. Dry the eyes. Oh, Gil. I can't believe you're in love with a ghost. But you wouldn't be in love with another man, would you? (laughs) Don't be silly. Let's go or I'll be late for my audition. Gilbert Franklin, please. One moment. Hello? Gil? Amanda? Oh, Gil, I'm so excited. You got the part? Not the little part, the walk-on. Gil, they listened to me for the ingenue lead. And I got it. I got it. Ingenue lead? Hey, that's fantastic. I can't believe it. I can't either. (laughs) This calls for a celebration. I'll take you out to dinner tonight. A champagne dinner. No, no, no. Let's celebrate here. At your place? I haven't cooked in a week. I'll go out and do some shopping. Okay, and I'll bring the champagne. Enough for the three of us. The three of us? You, me, and your ghost boyfriend. <laughs> I don't think that's very funny, Gil. Uh-oh, I put my foot in it again. Forgive me. Uh, now, come on, tell me you forgive me. I forgive you. And, uh, honey? Yeah? Ask Morley Norcross to forgive me, too. <laughs> well, I never, I just never... <laughs> I just never. You know, Amanda, that's virtually becoming a cue line for me. Why? Why have you gone so white? Why are you trembling so? I I know now that you're a ghost. Oh. It makes me feel scary. Oh, please, no. The last thing in the world I want is to frighten you. But you ought to know that, particularly since I did all I could today to help you get the ingenue lead in Hope Springs Eternal. You? Didn't you know? Yes, I did. I felt something. Something that lifted me above myself, above my talent. That made me act as I've never acted before. But I didn't know it was you. It was. I was there all the time, coaching you. Now, still frightened of me? No, not really. Only... Yes? Did you strangle them, Morley? The two women who lived here before you? Yes. I confess it, I did. Why? The painting there above the fireplace. I didn't tell you the whole story behind it. Why not? I was ashamed. Ashamed? Of what I did to Iris, or tried to do. You see, my dear, she didn't leave me for Thomas Broly just because she'd fallen out of love with me. I was the reason she fell out of love. My ungovernable temper. Temper? Rage is a closer word. Violent rage. Another word for it would be ego. 
My ego that demanded its way or I would fly into an insane fury. Iris, yes, the withered little woman who was your landlady feared me, loved me, but feared me. And that is why she left me. That is why, let me also confess, I killed myself out there by the fountain. Not from despair, as I told you. Not from misery. But from sheer, limitless, violent rage. And I have been paying for it ever since. Oh, Morley. You helped me today. How can I help you? Amanda. Are you sure you want to? Oh, yes. Very sure? Very sure. Then meet me. Meet me by the fountain tonight at ten minutes of twelve tonight. Ten minutes of twelve? That was the hour I took my life. Promise you'll be there. I'll be there, Morley. I promise. All right, Amanda. All right, I'll leave. Gil, don't be angry, but... What'd you expect me to be? I invite you to dinner to celebrate. You say, oh, no, come to my place, I'll make dinner... I come, I bring the champagne, and from the minute dinner is over, you keep suggesting I leave. Gil, it's late. A quarter to twelve midnight is late. It is for me. I've had a long, nerve-wracking day, and I'm... Okay, okay, I'm going. Do you want to know something? I may not be back. Oh, Gil. 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 The scent. The scent of lavender. Coming from the garden. Yes, Morley. I'm coming. Coming. Yes? Yes, who is it? Gil Franklin, Mrs. Brody. Oh, just a minute. Just a minute. What do you mean, disturbing an old woman at this hour of the night? I need my rest. And I need my girl, Mrs. Brody. The girl I intend to marry. What's that got to do with me? Maybe nothing, maybe everything. All I know, there's something queer going on here, especially tonight. And I intend to get to the bottom of it. Mrs. Broly, I want to know the whole story. The whole story, you understand? Of what's happened in that room since Morley Norcross committed suicide over 60 years ago. Amanda? Morley! I startled you again. Not really. It's just ten of twelve. And a beautiful moonlit night. Very beautiful. You're ready. You're sure you're ready to keep your promise. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. What do you want me to do? Amanda, you think of me as a ghost. You are. Ghost, ghost, it, it's only a word, my dear, because, because I am dead doesn't mean I don't exist. I do. I am as alive as you, only... I live on a different plane of existence now. A different plane of existence? You might even say a different level of consciousness. I... I don't understand. No mortal does. No mortal can. Uh, Try. It's... It's as simple as this. Nothing is. Nothing begins. Nothing ends. It's all the same. A continuum. Only on different levels, varying planes of life of living. To sum it up, my darling, there is no such thing as life. No such thing as death. I, I guess I don't understand. <laughs> you know, the level I'm on, I don't understand all of it either. This only do I know. The world that was once mine and is now yours is nothing but illusion. Illusion, my dearest. That is all it is So it will be only an illusion you leave now. Leave? My world? To enter mine. Oh. You promised. Remember, you promised. Yes, but... Oh, Morley, how can I leave it? My world? Illusion. Illusion, reality, call it what you like. I don't know. But Morley... Morley, I'm I'm going to be the ingenue lead in a Broadway play... It's what I've wanted, dreamed of, yearned for since I was a child. I can't leave that. You must. I can't. I tell you, you must. Can't you understand? What you're, what you're leaving is nothing. Nothing to what you'll find on my plane. I'm not taking anything from you. I'm giving you everything. But what I want... You promised. You promised. 
What in hell if you didn't promise? You're strangling me. You promised? You promised me. Stand up. Keep my promise. I didn't say I wouldn't. Only that... That I... Wanted something else. So much. So much. You wanted it? That much? You want it? That much? Yes. But you would give it up? For me? A promise is a promise. Oh, and a selfless act is a selfless act. What? Amanda? Amanda? She's not here in the room. The girl. Look, Amanda. Look. And listen. The fountain. It's flowing again. And birds singing in the garden at midnight. Remember, I said the fountain would never flow again. The birds sing no more until someone, somewhere, sometime, did something so supremely unselfish, so totally and completely selfless that the act of suicide committed here, my suicide, would be paid for. Oh, Amanda. 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 I knew it would be you. I knew it. Amanda. And I was right. Amanda. Oh, kill. Darling, darling. The fountain. Oh, my God, the fountain. Yes, it's flowing again, Mrs. Foley, and the birds are singing. I, I don't understand. I don't try. Just don't bother trying, Mrs. Foley. But, but I must, because I've always had the feeling that if ever the fountain started again, I... I would... Stop. You... You would... Oh, oh, oh. Gil, catch her. She's fainted. No, Amanda. She's dead. Not dead, Gil. Alive. Very much alive. On another level. Another plane of existence. And, oh, God. Make it a happier one for her. And Morley. <laughs> Planes of existence, levels of consciousness, the self, the over-self, the super-self. What do I know? It comes to that, what do you know? We don't. Because if what I read, what they tell me is so, our brains simply aren't equipped to understand. I once asked a Buddhist monk about this, and he said, you mustn't try to understand, just experience. <laughs> that says it all, I guess. I'll be back shortly. Amanda Phillips didn't become a Broadway star. She became Mrs. Gilbert Franklin. Oh, she played the ingenue lead in Hope Springs Eternal, all right. But the play folded in New Haven. Well, if Morley Norcross was right, it doesn't much matter. After all, the world we live in, you and I, nothing but illusion. Some illusion. Our cast included Diane Baker, John Newland, Anne Seymour, and Dennis Cole. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Now, a preview of our next tale. I'm not with the police, I swear it. And why all the questions, I, I, huh? Why all the nosing around? I, I, Take it please. easy. I don't oh. want no trouble in oh. here. She's something. Uh. She's got to be. Best told her I do business in your place, and now she shows up here the next morning. Don't that sound fishy to you? Well, it's funny. <laughs> Come on, baby. Jim. Jimmy, don't. I, I was just the statue. Oh, I just wanted the statue. The what? I, I guess she was this thing. What's oh. the statue got to do with... Wait a minute. Wait, wait, wait. You're, You're right, Worma. She's not a cop. 
Yeah, she's been acting like a cop, but that's not what she is. Please, please. Oh, please let me go. I, I didn't mean any harm. Please oh, let me no, go. Oh, no, no. Sugar, you're not a cop at all. What you are is a nun. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. appropriately used than to describe the story you're about to hear. It's about a man with a most unusual profession, a man who makes his livelihood by making escapes. But now, the great Ferlini is going to cap his exciting career with the greatest escape of all, even if it turns out to be the last escape. And if you think Houdini took great chances... Wait until you hear what the great Ferlini has in mind. That's right. I'm going inside that box in a bathing suit. And they're going to dump me right into the middle of the lake. Joe, well, that's crazy. It, it's too dangerous. What you mean is I'm too old for it, huh? But I'll show you, baby. I'm not too old for the trick. Or for you. <laughs> mystery drama, The Last Escape, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Henry Slesser and stars Joan Lovejoy and Robert Dryden. I'll be back shortly with Act One. We're in the glamorous Tropicana Supper Club. The music is playing... The palm trees are swaying, but unfortunately, the music is being produced by a sleazy three-piece band, the palm trees are papier-mâché, and the Tropicana isn't in the tropics. It's New Jersey. If there is any glamour here, it's the glamour of illusion. And that's what the customers have come to see. Ladies and gentlemen, here's what you've all been waiting for. Direct from command performances in London, Paris, and Rome, the man who defies ropes, chains, locks, handcuffs, steel boxes, and prison bars, the one, the only true successor to the immortal Houdini, here he is, Fellini the Great! Thank you, thank you! And ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to be here with you this evening. You know... Some people have asked me why I do these things. Why I continue to risk injury and even death in order to demonstrate my ability to escape from any bonds devised by mortal man. Well, let me tell you the reason. It's because of a deep, abiding love of liberty to demonstrate the indefatigable spirit of man in his quest for personal freedom, a freedom which each one of us enjoys in this wonderful country of ours. And now I'd like to introduce you to a lovely young lady 
who is going to assist me in my demonstration this evening. Here she is, Miss Wanda Wilson. As you can see, Miss Wilson is holding something in her hand. It's a straitjacket designed to restrain the most violent madman. Madness, as you know, often increases the strength of its victim enormously. But this jacket has been created so skillfully that experts would swear that there is no way out of one. The great Houdini, however, once proved that it can be done. And tonight, before your eyes, I am going to attempt to duplicate his astonishing escape. What is Yes, Fellini. Please ask two men from the audience to assist us. Yes, Fellini. Why don't you come up? Uh, how about, uh, what about you two gentlemen? Will you help out? Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> no, uh, uh, if you two gentlemen will just put the jacket on me. Yeah, yeah that's right. I fold my arms around my torso, and then you secure every strap. Yeah, yeah that's it. Just as tight as you can now. Hey, yeah, that's right. Every single one of them. A little tighter. Tighter. Make sure there's absolutely no way I could get out of it. Yeah. Thank you, gentlemen. And now, ladies and gentlemen... To spare you the sight of my agonies, Wanda will place a screen in front of me. Here it is, Fellini. Wanda, Wanda, can, can, can you come here a minute? No, Tommy, not now. The I've got to talk to you. Can, can you meet me later? No, no. See, now one strap is torn or broken. The straitjacket is in perfect condition, but I am free. I'll tell you one thing about this escape. You don't have to be crazy to try it, but it helps. <laughs> Tommy, I can't talk too long. Why would you come out without a coat? You'll freeze to death. Well, I couldn't very well have put a coat on. Joe would have asked where I was going. Mm. Where is he now? In the dressing room. I, I gotta get back there. Mm, he really keeps tabs on you, doesn't he? You know how he is. What did you want? You know what I wanted. To see you. To see you alone for a change. Oh, Tommy. They really liked your husband tonight, didn't they? Well, it's that kind of a crowd. I bet they liked you, too. Thanks. I, I didn't mean it that way. I mean, you know what I think of you, Tommy. Your singing, I mean. Is that all you mean? My singing? Tommy, don't, don't. Not here, not in this filthy alley. Where, then? There's no place I can ever see you. No place at all. It can't be helped. Joe has to know where I am every minute. He goes crazy if he doesn't see me around all the time. Not that he's jealous. He thinks too much of himself to be jealous of me. He just has to know I'm around, admiring him, waiting on him, hand and foot. Mm, he treats you like a slave. Tommy, I got to go. He's probably foaming at the mouth right this minute. Wanda, please, listen. One, one kiss. One. <sighs> All right. <sighs> oh, Lord, why does someone like you have to come along now? <laughs> I told you, I, I, I went to get some cigarettes from the machine. You shouldn't smoke. I never smoked in my life. You think I could have lungs like mine if I smoked? I got the lungs of a 20-year-old, you know that? Yeah, I, I know. Boy, I really felt good out there tonight. I could have done a steel box bust out tonight. That's how good I felt. Hey, you see that little guy who put me in a straitjacket? Little guy thought he was going to fix me. See how tight he worked the straps? I was there, Joe. The little guys, they're the worst. It's a pleasure to fool them. Joe, what do you say? Are you, are you just going to keep staring into that mirror all night? I like what I see. Don't you like what I see? I never knew anyone who liked to look at himself the way you do. Forty-nine years old. Nobody would ever take me for forty-nine. What do you say? 
You're a Greek god, Joe. And speaking of Greeks, we're invited out to dinner tonight. Roscoe is buying. Ah, uh, yeah, Roscoe, he spoils my appetite. You hear him talk, the escape business is dead. He should have seen that crowd tonight, that's all I say. He's no different. Well, he booked you into this job, didn't he? You ought to know if it's dead or not. Only thing wrong with the escape business, it don't get enough publicity. That's the only thing. All right, Joe. Everything comes back. Old movies come back. Old songs. Even old clothes. Only you gotta make a splash. And I mean a splash. Joe, you... You're not gonna start that again, are you? Start what? With Roscoe. You're not gonna start talking about that water business again, are you? I'm sick of that subject. Ah, you're getting old, Wanda. That's your trouble. The water trick is the best idea I had in years. Don't talk to me about age. You're no chicken, Joe, and don't forget it. An escape like that could be too much for you to handle. So I'm no chicken, huh? Listen, sugar. I count ten new wrinkles on your face since last week. Take a good look in a mirror. Oh, stop it, Joe. Go on, take a look. You're hurting me. Go on, I said. Look at yourself. Stop it. You call it old, huh? <laughs> I'm younger than you, baby. I'm kind of like All right, all right, all right. Just let me go. That's right. Turn on the tears. <laughs> Not everybody thinks I'm old, Joe. Not everybody. <laughs> You should have seen me tonight, Phil. I was the best. That crowd really ate it up. Didn't they want to? Yeah, it was a good crowd for that crummy joint. No, not crummy joints. Not if they pay off every Friday. Listen, after tonight, I wouldn't be surprised they book me for another month. I'd be surprised. You close next week. What? I told you it was a three-week engagement, Joe. Yeah, but you said... I mean, maybe it would go longer. Well, that's as far as it goes. Okay. Okay, we'll find someplace else, right? Someplace better than that crummy Tropicana. Sure, sure. I'm telling you, Phil, the escape business is coming back. And when it does, I'm going to be right on top. You're practically the only one left. All I need is one good break, one good publicity stunt. Uh-oh, here it comes. Starting with that water trick again? Yeah, that's right. But you're going to stop bothering me about that. I don't stop bothering you until we do it. Look, Joe, you know as well as me that times are different. 20, 30 years ago, a good press agent could ballyhoo an escape artist right onto the front pages. Only Houdini's been dead a long time. Sure, sure, Houdini's dead. But I'm alive. Me, Joe Fellini. It's one thing about you, Joe. You never had any trouble with false modesty. Listen, what could Houdini do that I can't? I work with the ropes, the chains, irons. I can get out of boxes, bags, hampers, chests. I can do all the handcuff routines. Nobody does a faster straitjacket than me. Besides, you know that Houdini used a lot of phony trick stuff. And I suppose you don't. Sure, sometimes. I got my skeleton keys, my phony bolts, and all that other junk. But you know me, Phil. I do my best tricks with muscle and brains, right? Sure, sure. You're the greatest, Joe. Yeah, I keep, I, I keep in shape. Ask Wanda here. One hour a day with the barbells. Yeah, I still got a terrific chest expansion. I can do this water trick, Bill. It'll be great. You know something, Wanda? Maybe the only way to stop your husband from talking about this is to let him do it. Oh, Phil, no. All right, Joe, how do you plan to work the act? I really do it up good, Phil. First, I'll let him handcuff me. I mean, genuine cuffs. All checked out by the chief of police or somebody like that. And what makes you think I can line up the chief of police? Then after I'm handcuffed, a rope around my body, around 50 feet. Then they put me in a burlap sack and tie it up good. Then they put the whole works into a steamer trunk and dump me right in the middle of the lake. How's that sound? Like sudden death. <laughs> Don't worry about it. Two minutes after that trunk goes into the water, out I come. Then all I got to do is swim. And how do you plan to do it? Oh, I ain't giving away no trade secrets, Phil. All I can say is I got a new gimmick that'll make it more sensational than even the water trick Houdini did. Phil, you can't let him go through with this. It's a trick for a young man. It's... I can do it, I said. Just tell me when we start, Phil. I'll tell you when, Joe. As soon as you can prove to me that you can swim. Really a miracle.
circle. I never thought you'd be able to get away from that guy, Wanda. Well, Joe, finally went someplace he couldn't take me. Where's that? To a men's gym. He went to swim in their pool. What for? Oh, he's, he's going to do a trick. He calls it the water trick. He gets handcuffed and tied and all that, and then they dump him into the lake in a big steamer trunk. Ooh. That sounds pretty dangerous. Well, the only danger would be Joe getting too winded to swim to the surface. I know he can get out of the cuffs and the ropes and all that, yeah, it but... It seems to me that if the slightest thing went wrong... Uh... Oh, he'll take all the precautions, or, or we will, rather. We? Well, I help him out. That's the trick part of it. Oh. Then there is a trick. <laughs> part of it's a trick, naturally. But, uh, even the tricks go wrong sometimes. Don't they? Yeah. Yeah, they do. Uh, did anything like that ever happen to your husband? Well, mm. yeah, once. He, he couldn't open the lock on his handcuffs. See, he had a key hidden in the cuff of his trousers, but it slipped out of his hand and fell between the cracks of the floorboard. He wasn't hurt or anything. It was just a wicker basket escape on stage. I see. But if anything like that happened now, I mean, uh, at the bottom of a lake... But that would be terrible. It would be awful. Yeah. It would be really tragic, wouldn't it? I, I don't want to think about any such thing. I, I just don't want to think about it. No, 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 of course not, Wanda. At least uh, we won't think about it tonight. Well, unless I heard wrong, it sounds to me that I've just heard a conversation about murder. No, the word wasn't spoken. The plans weren't made. But it wasn't difficult to hear between the lines. Will Mrs. Joe Ferlini really spoil the grandiose plans of Ferlini the Great? We'll find out when we return shortly with Act Two. Engagement is over for Ferlini the Great at the Tropicana Supper Club. But now Joe Ferlini and his wife have a new address, a small and rather shabby hotel which bears the name of Lakeview, undoubtedly because it's located on the edge of Lake Paradise. This afternoon, Wanda Ferlini is alone and bored, disinterested in her copy of Variety, tired of reading about the success of others. But then... One second. Oh, Tommy. Hello, Wanda. Surprised? Well, of course I am. What are you doing here? Isn't it obvious? I came to see you. No, no, no. Scratch that. For a publication, I came to audition for a singing job with the Lake Paradise Inn. Is that the truth? You know what the truth is. Look, uh, can I come in? Oh, yeah. Yeah, of course. I've uh, already tried to get a job at the end. Nothing doing there. But Ferlini doesn't have to know that, does he? You shouldn't have come here, Tommy. It, it won't look right. Where is he? Joe? He, he's at the lake swimming. Uh, That's all he's been doing for days now, practicing his swimming. Then he's really going to go through with it, the uh, water trick. Oh, he's coming through with it, all right. His agent, uh, you know, Phil Roscoe. Yeah, yeah, I know. Well, he's actually getting excited about it. Can you imagine? He, he's been doing a terrific job of lining up publicity. Publicity won't help Ferlini, Wanda. You know it won't. He's old hat. That escape stuff died when Houdini did. Well, you never know, Tommy. I mean... He's actually gotten the local chief of police to cooperate. He's, he's going to make sure that the handcuffs are absolutely genuine. But your husband can still get out of them, right? Well, yeah, he, he always does. How? Tommy, I told you I didn't want to talk about that anymore. I, I don't like what you're... Well, you know what I mean. You don't like what I'm implying, right? No, I can't blame it on you. I'm the one who did all the implying. I'm the one who said that if one little thing goes wrong, Joe's a dead man, he'll drown. One little thing. We've got to stop this. Good Lord, we can't talk about murder like it, 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 it's something casual. Murder? 
Isn't that what we decided? Just because something goes wrong with the act, that isn't murder. We're not going to be arrested for me. Please, Tommy, I'm trying to forget what we said. Did you forget saying that you love me? No. No, I didn't forget that. Is it still true? Oh, you know it is. <laughs> Wanda. Tommy, don't. What if he walked in? Then you know who'll get murdered. You and me, both of us. Yeah. How's he been treating you? Worse than ever. Every day it's worse. All he thinks about is the act. Night and day. Escape, escape, escape. Oh, sometimes he seems to go crazy, Tommy. I mean it. Easy, easy. He wakes up in the middle of the night, throws off the covers, and takes a bow. Uh, Wanda, what's this? What? These handcuffs. Are these the ones he uses in his act? Well, those are the new cuffs. The, uh, the ones he plans to use for the water trick? Yeah, that's right. Hmm. They look real, all right. They are real. Oh, they're not trick handcuffs? No. This police chief who's going to inspect them, he's an expert in this kind of thing. Oh, he, he'd spot a trick cuff in two seconds. But Ferlini still gets out of them. Well, he has to. He can't get out of the ropes or the sack and then the steamer trunk. Okay, okay, okay. Then tell me how he does it. You must know, Wanda. Yeah, I... I... I know. Well, then show me. Okay. Hey, uh, hmm. uh, w w what are you doing? Putting the cuffs on you. <laughs> I'm no escape artist. I'll show you how to be one, Tommy. There. Now, see if you can get your hands loose. Uh, <laughs> well, I can't. It's impossible. That's right. It's impossible. Without this. Oh, a key. Yeah, just this tiny key. That's all it takes. Just turn the key and it's open. Are you telling me that he has the key with him when he goes into that lake? Well, of course. There's no other way. I mean, the key is hidden someplace, like in the trunk or the bag, someplace like that. Oh, he, he can't take the chance with this trick. Every single piece of equipment will be thoroughly checked out by the police. Well, then how will he manage the key? Well, he hasn't told me that yet. Usually he has it sewn into the cuff of his trousers. Uh-huh. And is that what he's going to do now? I just don't know, Tommy. Well, all I know is this. What we talked about still makes sense to me. Very good sense. All you have to do is make sure that Ferlini the Great has the wrong key. <laughs> look at that story, Phil. Just look at it. Four big columns all about me. And don't get carried away, huh? It's a big story, but a very little paper. Circulation 10,000, maybe. No, that don't matter. It's a beginning. Just the beginning. When I pull that stunt on Saturday morning, I'll be on all the wire services. You wait and see. Now, I just hope you don't end up in the obituary column. Ah, stop worrying about me. Well, I'd worry a lot less if you'd tell us how you're going to do this trick, Joe. That's what I keep asking him. I've been working for this guy for 18 years, and I know every stunt he pulls. Only this time... This time, I'm doing something different. Something really terrific. Look, will you tell us what it is, Joe? <laughs> I'm knocking myself out, rounding up the press. Getting the police to cooperate. I even got us a motorboat free of charge to take you out in the middle of the lake. Yeah, yeah, you're doing a real good job, Phil. I know you wouldn't let me down. I haven't even told you the best part. I got a big news magazine guy coming out. What? That's right. It's a guy I used to know a long time ago. He works on the show business section. I talked him into coming out. If he likes what he sees, well, who knows? You might get some pretty good national publicity. Hey, hey, hey that's great, Phil. That's just terrific. Only I'll tell you this, pal. If I don't learn some details, I'm, I'm going to be tempted to call the guy and put him off. I don't want him to come all the way out here just to see a guy get himself drowned. That's not the kind of news I want to see printed. Come on, Joe. Tell us what you're going to do. Okay. You want the scoop? Here's how it goes. The steamer trunk is no problem. It'll have a phony bottom. The canvas bag is no sweat either. That'd be the usual type I use. Pull the thread on top, the whole seam comes open. Yeah, I know about those gimmicks. As for the ropes, that will be pure muscle. I'll just make with the chest and muscle expansion. By the time they load the trunk on a motorboat... I'll be out of the ropes. By the time they're ready to dump me in the lake, I'll be out of the canvas bag. But first you have to get the handcuffs off. 
Sure. That's the most important part. What's it going to be, the key in your cuff? <laughs> well, what's so funny? <laughs> there ain't going to be any cuffs. What? You heard me. I figure that's the first thing those smart guys will be looking for. Me having a key hidden. So I'll fool them. Completely. How? I mean, I'll let the cops examine me from head to foot to make sure I'm not hiding a key on me. And instead of pants, I'll wear a bathing suit. Are you nuts? Joe, you, you've got to have a key. There's no other way to get those handcuffs open. Oh, sure, sure. I'll have it on me. Because you're going to pass it to me, honey. Me? That's right. Well, how will I do that and then get away with it? Ah, that's the part I just dreamed up, and it's a beauty. You're my wife, see? You're going to have to kiss me goodbye before I go into that steamer trunk, right? Yeah. Well, guess what you have in your mouth when you give me that kiss? The key. Yeah, that's right. You'll kiss me bye-bye and pass that key from your mouth to mine. And that way, I'll be able to slip the key into the lock with my teeth. Get it? It's a good gimmick, Joe. It's beautiful, Phil. Beautiful. It can't miss. Yeah. Yeah, it does make sense. Nobody would think it's strange that I kiss you goodbye. You're the most natural thing in the world, honey. After all, any wife would kiss her husband when she may never see him again. That's it, Joe. Just breathe deep. Get plenty of oxygen into your lungs. You're going to need it. Oh, stop worrying about me, Phil. I feel great. I feel terrific. Hey, how's that crowd out there? It's okay. Maybe a hundred people. I didn't count it. Yeah, but that guy's there, isn't he? One from the news magazine? Yeah, he's here and a couple of other newspaper guys. One of them from New York. Yeah, it's going to work, Phil. I can tell. I'm going to really make it back to the big time. Well, if you're ready, the chief is waiting for you. I'm ready. Chief Wallace, I'd like you to say hello to the great Ferlini. I do, Mr. Ferlini. I sure hope you know what you're doing. Ferlini, this is Mr. Ralph Crimmins, president of the local Chamber of Commerce, Frank Petty of the Lake Paradise Tribune, and you've already met Dave Brooks, our motorboat pilot. Well, let's get started. Huh? It's a warm day, and I want to go in for a little dip. <laughs> <laughs> Chief Wallace, yeah, yeah. would you begin by placing the handcuffs on Mr. Ferlini? I certainly will. Uh, now, you've examined these cuffs, Chief, and you're sure they're genuine? Oh, they're genuine, all right. Would you clap them on, please? All uh, right. There you are, Mr. Ferlini. Now, if you other gentlemen will please tie this rope around the great Ferlini's body, make as many knots as you wish. Uh, 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 can, can I lend a hand there, too? I uh, used to be a Boy Scout. Oh, help yourself, Chief. <laughs> May I please have the canvas bag? Right here. Thank you. Now... As soon as these gentlemen have finished tying up the great Ferlini, we'll put the canvas bag over his head and lower him into the steamer trunk. Don't worry, Wanda. I'm going to be fine. Perhaps you'd like to kiss your husband goodbye, Mrs. Ferlini. And from the looks of things, I'd say that would be a very good idea. Ladies and gentlemen, the motorboat has stopped in the middle of the lake. Now, please watch carefully. Now, the trunk has been brought to the end of the boat. Chief Wallace and Dave Brooks, our pilot, are carefully lowering it over the side. There it goes, into the water. The steamer truck has gone straight to the bottom of the lake like a stone. The great Ferlini is inside in the greatest life and death struggle of his career. Can he work his way free of those steel manacles? Can he escape from 50 yards of rope bound tightly around his body? Can he get out of the canvas sack that covers him from head to foot? Can he break through the solid locks of that trunk and manage to reach the surface on time? Wanda. Tommy, you shouldn't have come here. I, I just thought it would have been uh, better. It's 15 seconds now. 15 long, long seconds for the great Ferlini. Wanda. What? Is everything all right? Please, don't talk to me now, Tommy. Not now. I'm sorry. I, 
I've missed you so much these past three days. I couldn't see you. You know we shouldn't be seen together. Oh, I don't see why not. Everybody knows we're friends. We met at the Tropicana. 30 seconds. The great Fellini has been underwater, sealed in that trunk for a full 30 seconds. And there's no sign of him. Is he all right? Wanda... When I talked to the manager of the inn again. He didn't seem to have a spot for me at the show at the NMX. God, please tell me, how can you talk about show business now? Well, isn't that what this is all about? Show business? Wanda, Wanda, for God's sake, what's happening out there? I don't know. How should I know? Why doesn't he come up? He said he'd be up in 20 seconds, no more than that. I just don't know, Phil. 45 seconds and he's not up. He's got to be all right. He's got to be. Everything went just the way we planned. Hey, there, there isn't a sign of him, not a ripple on the water. He's gone. No, it didn't work. It didn't work. Not coming up. He's drowned. No. He's drowned. Well, it looks as if the trick has failed. Or perhaps you could say that the trick has been too successful. The one played on Fellini the Great by his not-so-loving wife. Now uh, the question remains, will the crime go unpunished? Or does fate have at least one more trick up its sleeve? We'll find out shortly when we return with Act Three. The great Fellini is dead. His waterlogged body, still loosely bound in rope, Still encased in a canvas bag, which became his shroud, still in the steamer trunk, which became his coffin, has been removed from Lake Paradise. Now it's a time of mourning and a time of questions. <laughs> I'm really sorry to be bothering you folks at a time like this, but... Um... In cases like these, we need to produce certain facts for the coroner's office. You understand? Yes, of course, Lieutenant. It's just that well, there isn't much to say about Joe's death. Things went wrong. That's all there is to it. Well, that's what we'd like to know. Uh, what things went wrong, exactly? Uh, how can anybody answer that? So many things can go away with an act like that. That's the truth, Lieutenant. An escape act is a matter of split-second timing. Everything's got to be done carefully. Precisely. If one factor goes badly, well, you saw what happened. Mm -hmm. I told Joe not to go through with this. He was just too old for such a dangerous stunt. He'd never tried this water trick before? <laughs> no, never. No. It was Houdini. Houdini did it. Joe always wanted to do something to make him better known than Houdini. Houdini's been gone a long time. Did he still consider him competition? <clears throat> yeah, that's the way Joe was. Alive or dead. The only thing that mattered was reputation. <clears throat> fame. Did you try to stop him from this attempt, Mrs. Fernandez? <laughs> yes, I did. I did everything I could. I pleaded with him. I begged him. Maybe it was my fault, Lieutenant. Maybe I should have listened to Mrs. Perlini. But Joe just kept after me about it. Until... <laughs> His reflexes were too slow. That was the real trouble. Well, that makes sense, I guess, Mrs. Perlini. But it isn't a fact. I still need a rough idea of what might have gone wrong. I, I guess that means you'll have to tell me how he intended to get out of that steamer trunk. Well, I don't know if we can do that, Lieutenant. You mean you don't know? Well, I mean, it's still a professional secret. The man is dead, Mr. Roscoe. Yeah, but just the same. I mean, well, you don't know the pride people like Joe Ferlini take in their work, in their methods... If I tell you how he did his tricks, it would be kind of a betrayal. Look, I appreciate how you feel, Mr. Roscoe, but uh, I'm not going to publish any expose on the man. I've just got to supply some answers for the record. Well, I just don't see the point of it. It could have been any of a dozen things. Well, just name some. All right. Obviously, he couldn't get the handcuffs off. The key must have dropped out of his mouth. What key? You... You didn't find a key? We weren't looking for one. Well, there was a key, all right. Wanda passed it to him before he got into the trunk. But his arms were bound to his side. How could he open the cuffs, even with a key? With his teeth. Joe's done that a hundred times. But this time, well, he couldn't make it. Well, he searched the trunk. It was empty. It probably fell out of the trunk when they opened it. It's only a tiny key. A fish probably swallowed it by now. I see. 
And if Ferlini couldn't get out of the cuffs... He couldn't get out of the ropes, or the canvas sack, or the steamer trunk. And then the air began to give out... Oh, and... Phil, that's enough, please, that's enough. Yeah, yeah, Mrs. Ferlini, okay. I guess that's enough for today. It's uh, pretty obvious what happened, and I guess it'll be obvious to the coroner, too. Death by misadventure. <laughs> by misadventure. Now, that's what I'd call a perfect description. Oh, how can you sound so happy about it? <laughs> Why should I be unhappy? Tommy, the man is dead. He died a horrible he death. He died doing what he wanted to do. What more can a man ask? No. No, you know the real truth. He died because of me. Because I gave him the kiss of death. No, 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 don't say things like but that. But it's true. It's absolutely true. I gave him his final kiss, and I passed the wrong key from my lips to him. You don't have to worry about that. You said the police never found the key to the handcuffs. No. No, they never found the key. They can't trace his death to me. Well, then you're safe. Safe? Is that what you call it? I killed him, he Tommy. You paid him back for a lifetime of torture. He was never happier in his whole life. I never saw him so happy. He thought he was going to be so famous. Look, look, try to stop thinking about it so much. Do you think I slept a wink last night? All I could think about was, was the way that trunk looked when it slid into the lake with Joe inside of it. And the way we waited and waited. And, and then the trout out, coming huh? up all wet and slimy and Joe's still inside. Oh, my God, Tommy, I never had a nightmare that bad in my life. And it, it was all true. Well, there's something else that's true. Joe Ferlini is being buried this morning. And that means you'll never have to worry about his mistreating you again. Yeah. I won't have to worry about living with Joe anymore. Now I'll have to worry about living with myself. You don't have to live by yourself. You've got me now, Wanda. Oh, please, Tommy, not now. I can't listen to such talk now. Not on the way to the funeral. Dear friends, we are gathered here today to consign the mortal remains of Joseph Martin Ferlini to the earth which bore him. Joseph Ferlini was a man of courage and strength, a man who devoted his life to bring pleasure to others. He was, in fact, a man who sacrificed his life to that devotion. He used to say to his audiences, I wish to demonstrate that there is something in the human spirit which cannot be changed. And there is something called the human soul which cannot be kept behind bars. This was Joseph Ferlini, who died performing the work of his life. And who can say... Excuse me! Is this a Ferlini funeral? Right. I beg your pardon? I don't mean to interrupt you, Reverend, but this is the Ferlini service, right? Uh, yes, that's true. Well, I'm sorry to break this up, but uh, I'm from the county corner. Phil, yeah, what's going on? I don't know. Let's go see. Uh, really, I, I, I can't imagine what this is all I'm about. I'm afraid but... the funeral services can't continue. You see, uh, we have orders to attach the body of Joseph Ferlini. Yes, but surely... What's going you... on here? What's the matter? Uh, I'm sorry, ma'am. Uh, are you Mrs. Ferlini? Yes. Why'd you stop the service? I have a court order. Now, the coroner is requesting a further examination of the remains. What? I'm afraid I'll have to open the coffin, Mrs. Ferlini. Open but the you coffin? Can't. You can't mean that. He's going to be buried. You can't open his coffin Come here. Come on, you can't get away with that. I don't have any choice. Now, there's a caretaker's cottage on the grounds, and we can use that for the examination. Uh, uh, would you gentlemen please uh, pick up the coffin and follow Phil, me? Phil, don't let them do it. Uh, no, 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 hush, one. It's all right. I'm sure it's just a formality. Uh, please. The sooner we get this over with, the better. All right, now. Now, please stand back while I open the coffin. Oh, my God. I don't want to look. Don't let it bother you, Wanda. You saw Joe when he was in the funeral parlor. He'll look just the same now. Would you... Give me a hand with this lid. Yeah, sure. Oh, it's empty. Dear Lord in heaven, 
What, what did you say? Don't look, Wanda. But he's gone. Well, how could he get out of his own coffin? Gone? Did you say Joe is gone? He is dead! <laughs> All right, Mr. Roscoe, um, let's hear the whole story from the beginning. Look, I'm really sorry about this, Lieutenant. It was just something I couldn't help. I mean, a promise is a promise. Yes, and breaking the law is breaking the law. I'm not under arrest, am I? Well, we'll determine that after you tell me the truth. Well, you got to understand the way things are in my profession. Everything is showmanship, everything. That's what my life has been for the past 30 years. Is that how long Fellini was your client? Practically. And in the early days, everything was different. Ballyhoo, crazy stunts, way out schemes for getting publicity. You know how it is. What about the missing body? Well, it was like a pact that I made with Joe. A pact? Yeah. That's the kind of guy he was. A showman to the end. And I really mean the end. Well, uh... What was the deal? He made me promise him that if anything happened to him, if he died, that I would arrange for one last escape. Something that would make him remembered even longer than Houdini. Are you telling me this was all a cheap publicity stunt? No, it was a trick, Lieutenant. That's the word for it. I slipped the undertaker a hundred bucks, and he arranged to have Ferlini buried someplace secretly. Then he put an empty coffin in the hearse with some slates in the bottom to give it weight. Oh, for the love of Pete man from the coroner's office. He was a phony, too. It was an actor I hired, so we could open the coffin right on the spot. You see what I mean? Showmanship. Yes, I see what you mean, all right. But I suppose you know what the effect of your showmanship has been. What do you mean? I'm talking about Mrs. Ferlini. Yeah, I feel rotten about that. But I couldn't tell her in advance, Lieutenant. Joe made me swear not to tell anyone. He wanted the mystery to last forever and ever. The last escape of Ferlini the Great. But considering what happened to Mrs. Ferlini, you had to tell the truth. Yeah, I had to. Tell me, how is she, Lieutenant? Where have you got her now? As a matter of fact, she's right next door. How's she doing? Look for yourself. <laughs> oh, my oh, God. Yeah. Wanda. Yeah. Wanda. She's completely out of her head, Mr. Roscoe. And she isn't the escape artist her husband was. She can't get out of that straight jacket. Well, so Wanda Ferlini does go to prison for her crime. But in this case, it's the kind of prison whose bars are created in one's own mind. And it may well be the most cruel and unusual punishment of all. By the way, you may be interested to know that some doctors prefer to call a straitjacket a camisole. I think it's a much more suitable word, especially if it's going to be worn by a lady. I'll be back shortly. It's really a pity that the days of Houdini and his like seem to be gone. However, we think Joe Ferlini was right. Everything does come back. And we can probably look forward to seeing a whole new generation of escape artists, magicians, and illusionists. In fact, you're enjoying one of the greatest illusionists of all time right this minute. It's called Radio our cast included Robert Dryden, Joan Lovejoy, Joseph Julian, Russell Horton, and Bob Caliban. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Now, a preview of our next tale. You mean she felt that guilty about what had happened? Mm. Guilty enough to seek punishment for herself. And she did. She punished herself by losing the use of her legs. And, and so, your treatment was able to cure her. Yes, I'm happy to say. It couldn't cure me. See, I didn't lose that use of my hands for any kind of reason like that. I mean, it's just some sort of nerve damage. 
well, if that's the diagnosis of your physician, that it's purely physical and incurable. But I didn't say that. See, I mean, my doctor has never used the word incurable. I have been hoping for years that it would just heal itself. I can't go on living like this. I want my hands back. Oh, dear God, I want my hands. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Marshall. Take a chair or stretch out on the sofa, whatever you like. Are you old enough to remember the opening of a popular daytime soap opera? And now, When a Man Marries, the tender story of young married life dedicated to everyone who has ever been in love. Of course, we've changed the title by one word and made it When a Man Marries. But everything is changing so fast these days, that shouldn't surprise anybody. The conventional wisdom is turning to nonsense before our astonished eyes. And the day may not be far off when the man, not the girl, walks proudly down the aisle to join his eager bride at the altar. Stranger things have not only happened, they are happening right now. I'm getting married tomorrow. Oh? Anyone I know? Mildred Cavanaugh. Well, her father's a patient of mine. Oh, don't tell him I was here. <laughs> Why not? He might tell her. So? She'd kill me. Our mystery drama, Mind Over Matthew, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Elspeth Eric and stars William Redfield. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Someone who probably knows as little about it as anyone else once told me that if a man hasn't married by the time he's 35, chances are he'll stay single all his life. Well, our hero, Matthew Parker, being 40, is about to become the exception to that rule. If it ever was a rule, which I doubt. Listen with me now to the tender human story of when a man of 40 marries. Morning, Hester. Why, Mr. Parker, good morning. Uh, how are you, Hester? Oh, I'm fine. Well, I must say you're looking very well. <laughs> very well indeed. Oh, I feel very well. Well, so what brings you here? Uh, is Dr. Caparotti in? You didn't have an appointment, did you? No, 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 I, I just took a chance. Oh, well, his 11 o'clock is late. <laughs> He's in his office. Oh, good, good. Okay to go right in? I think so, just not first. Sure, sure. I must say, I've never seen you looking better. Thank you. Yes? Hello, Fred. Oh, Matthew. How are you, fella? Well, you look great. <laughs> well, that's what Hester was just saying. Well, she's right. You feel okay? Marvelous. So what do you want with the doctor? Not that I'm not always glad to see you. Well, it's, uh, it's about my warts. Oh, Matthew. On my left hand, you know. <laughs> I thought we'd about given up on those. Warts are pesky things. Oh, Fred, I can't give up, no. Well, I've tried everything, Matthew. Why don't you just resign yourself? I can't. I'm getting married. You what? I know, I know. I'm 40 years old, never been married, but, well, I... 
I'm in love. <laughs> Do I know her? Uh, Mildred Cavanaugh? Well, she, she's only 20, Fred, but very mature. Well, her father's a patient of mine. Yeah, but you don't know Mildred. Well, she's never been to see me, no. Oh, but... uh, Mildred doesn't have much use for doctors. No? Well, say, <laughs> I feel that way myself sometimes. Yeah, Mildred says whatever's wrong with her, she can cure herself. Uh-huh. How does she manage that? By the force of her unconscious will. That's what she says, Fred. I don't necessarily believe it. Mind over matter, eh? Uh-huh, uh-huh, something like that. Oh, she's a very healthy girl. <laughs> Most people are at age 20. You know, she never even has the sniffles. Or if she does, she dispels them. Yeah, well, all sniffles go away eventually. Yeah, but Mildred's go away in, oh, two minutes, three at the most. She changes her thinking and they go away. Fred, I'm telling you, I've seen it happen. <laughs> Matthew, any doctor is a fool who denies the power of the mind over the body, and I certainly don't. Uh, you won't tell Mr. Cavanaugh I was in to see you, will you, Fred? Oh, I don't see why I should mention it. Well, he might say something to Mildred. So what if he did? She'd kill me. Surely not that. Well, she's pretty violent on the subject. She says once we're married, I won't have any pains or sicknesses of any kind. She'll see to that. What is she, some kind of a witch? Oh, she's a sweet, lovely girl. And, Fred, I do feel better. I mean, healthier and stronger since I've known her. <laughs> I think a sweet, lovely girl at 20 would make me feel better, too, Matthew. <laughs> yes? Your 11 o'clock is here, Doctor. Okay, okay, I'll leave. Um... About my warts. Uh, Fred, we're getting married in a church. You know, it's very dressy and all that. Well, you'll be wearing gloves, Matt. Nice, clean, white gloves. Well, yeah. Ah, I'll... Stop. Forget about the warts. That's my advice to you. Uh, all right, if you say so. I say so. Look, I don't suppose I'll be seeing you from now on. Listen, we're still friends, aren't we? Of course, of course. Well, I don't want to hold you up. Uh, so long, Fred. Goodbye, Hester. Good luck, Matthew. Goodbye, Mr. Parker. Well, why won't he be seeing you from now on, Doctor? Well, he's marrying a young lady 20 years of age who doesn't believe in doctors. Oh? <laughs> what does she believe in? <laughs> mind over matter. Or I should say, mind over Matthew. <laughs> Come to bed, darling. In a minute? Now. Okay, Maddie. If you insist. Oh. Oh, Mildred. You're so lovely. Oh, wait a second. What for? Well, let me get rid of this headache. You've got a headache? You? I never said I was perfect. Well, I'll get you an ask. No, I... Never take pills of any kind. I've told you that. Oh, honey, everybody I takes them. I don't. I never have. I never will. But just let me lie here and concentrate. Oh. What are you concentrating on? Horizons. There isn't any horizon, honey. This is our bedroom. Uh, is it okay for me to kiss your shoulder while you're concentrating? I guess... Are you hypnotizing yourself? I don't think so. Are you in a trance? Honey, look. No. No, you're not in a trance. You look kind of far away, but you're not in a trance. I'm not in a trance. Well, then what are you? Is this some kind of auto-suggestion? I've heard of that. That must be it. Uh, is it? I'm extending my powers, that's all. Oh, extending your that's all, huh? Mm-hmm. Oh. Uh, is it gone yet, the headache? It's going. Oh, good, good. Uh, gone? Just about. Tell me when. Now. Uh, that, that, that's marvelous, the way you do that. It's nothing, really. I'm, I, I couldn't do it to save me. Oh, yes, you could. Anybody could. Didn't you say something before about kissing my shoulder? Oh, you know what? I'm going to start with your fingertips. 
I'm going to kiss them, and then I'm going to kiss your hand and your arm and your elbow and right on up to your shoulder and then your neck. Oh, why don't you start? Start. Oh. Mm-hmm. Oh. Mm-hmm. Oh. Oh. First little finger. Mm-hmm. Second little finger. Third little finger. Mm. Fourth little finger. Mm. Oh, mm. Daddy. Don't stop, sweetheart. Oh, little wrist. Mm. Don't stop. Little arm. Daddy, don't stop. Mm. Mm. I said, don't stop. Oh, no, never. Why did you mm. stop? Huh? I didn't. I didn't. You did. Uh, uh, look, we'll, we'll start over, okay? Uh, one little finger. Mm-hmm. Two little fingers. Mm-hmm. Three little fingers. Morning, Hester. Oh, hi, Mr. Parker. Hello. Uh, the doctor in? Uh, yeah, well, he's on the phone, but he'll be through in a minute. Well, long time no see. Married life agreeing with you? Oh, boy. Yes, it's agreeing with me. You look awfully well. Oh, I am awfully well. I guess a wife was just what you needed. Well, this wife was. Uh, she's very young, the doctor tells me. Uh, 20. Pretty? Oh, it's very pretty. Oh, isn't that nice? Oh, the doctor's off the phone now, and you can go right in. Thanks. Go in. Well, Matthew, good to see you, fella. Hello, Fred. <laughs> well, for Pete's sake, how are you? Wonderful, just wonderful. Ah, so this is not a professional call, eh? Good. Ah, uh, in a way, Fred, it is. Oh, something wrong? No, something right, I think. Fred, I think my warts are going away after all this time. Well, let's have a look. Yeah. See? Don't they look better to you? Yeah. Yes, I do. Mildred's been working on them, Fred. Working on them? How? Huh. Oh, not medically, Fred. Spiritually. Oh? They're like you said, mind over matter. But they are better, aren't they, Fred? Yes. Definitely. They've been disappearing one by one. That's what puzzles me. Huh? Why? What puzzles you? Well, warts don't disappear one by one, as a rule. Warts are small tumors on the skin formed by enlargement of the papillae. Well, why shouldn't they go away one by one? Uh, Because medically, that's not the way it works. They disappear all at once, together. At least that's been our medical experience. Well, your medical experience must be wrong. Maybe it is this time. Medicine has nothing to do with it, perhaps. You, You mean it is Mildred that did it? Well, I was never able to do it, that's for sure. Mildred did it by the force of her unconscious will? Well, I I wouldn't know about that. But as I've told you, every doctor makes a little bow in the direction of mind over matter. Yeah, but is it Mildred's mind or my mind? Who knows? Well, I wasn't ever able to do it before. Matthew, I heard of a boy once who had warts. A lot of them. And his mother was in despair over it. But you know what she did? She told him she'd give him a quarter for every wart. You know what happened? The warts fell off one by one. Cost the lady about $15. One by one, they disappeared, like mine are doing. Um, did, did the boy's warts ever come back? Not that I know of. He and his mother left town shortly afterwards. It uh, got a little uncomfortable for them. Everybody was saying she was a witch. Is that what they called her? Not that I think she was, necessarily. Fred, how do you tell a witch? Oh, I don't know too much about that, Matthew. Why don't you ask Esther? She knows everything there is to know about witches. Well, I'd rather not talk about it to Esther, if you don't mind. Why, well, why can't you tell me? Well, all right. Um, witches are very nice people, actually, so Hester says. I mean, they're not like sorcerers. Sorcerers tend to be uh, malevolent mean sort of people, making blood sacrifices and all that, weaving spells, concocting potions, holding rituals, all that sort of thing. That's sorcery. But witchcraft, well, 
Witchcraft doesn't go in for any of that, Hester says. Witchcraft is just the use of our unconscious powers. The unconscious will. Yeah, the unconscious force or urge. Well, whatever. But, but Fred, how do you know who's a witch and who isn't? Well, you really should ask Hester about that. No, no, please. I, I want you to tell me. <laughs> well, for one thing, Hester says that a true witch always has one spot on her body which feels no pain at all, which is completely insensitive. Insensitive to pain. One spot. That's what she says. Uh, Fred, would it follow that this one spot on a witch's body that is insensitive to pain... Fred, would that spot be insensitive to pleasure, too? Well, I suppose it would. Why, Matthew? Oh, Fred, I think it's possible. I think it's just possible I married a witch. <laughs> When a man marries, he takes a chance. That's all I can say. He can marry a woman with a better mind than he has, which is humiliating. Or he can marry a woman with a mind inferior to his, which is boring. But what if he marries a woman with a subconscious mind that is active and brilliant and on call at a moment's notice, while his own remains stubbornly sluggish and very, very sub. What then? Why, it could drive a man clean out of both his minds. I'll be back shortly with Act Two. Our 40-year-old hero, Matthew Parker, has married a 20-year-old lady with an insensitive area on her right arm just above the elbow and a powerful subconscious mind. Matthew, on the other hand, has warts on one hand and a subconscious mind which has not shown signs of life in years. Mildred's subconscious is dispelling his warts, but the numb area just above her elbow is a mystery and a torment to Matthew's very conscious Mind. I haven't come clean with you before, Fred. I, I was afraid to. Matthew, you can tell me anything. You know that. I'm your doctor. Well, you won't tell Mildred, will you? I don't even know your wife. Yeah, but you know her father. Don't tell him. Don't tell him what? You won't tell him. Well, I, I won't tell him. Now, now, what is it? Well, Mildred and I, we... Oh, boy, is this embarrassing. Um, you see, when Mildred and I go to bed... Oh... Oh, uh, come on, Matt. You're a grown man. Well, I know, but this is so personal. I, I wouldn't be telling you at all if it wasn't for that witch business we were talking about. Well, you told me you thought Mildred might be a witch because of your warts disappearing. Ah, that's not the only reason. There's something else. Oh. Uh, well, why don't you tell me and stop stalling? Well, Fred, you see, when Mildred and I are in bed, we... Yeah? We, we, we start off, well, you know, with a... With a little game, sort of. I mean, I... I, I kiss her. Um, well, that's a good way to start off. Yeah, I mean, I, I kiss each little finger, and then her wrist, and then her arm. Yeah, okay, I get the picture. Now, this is a right arm I'm talking about. Does it have to be? Well, it doesn't happen with her left arm. What doesn't happen? For Pete's sake, Matthew... Well, no, I... her left arm is okay, but you see, there's a place, a little patch of skin... On her right arm that... Well, when I kiss it, she... She doesn't feel it. Well, how do you know she doesn't feel it? Because while I'm kissing her, I... Oh, Fred, I feel terrible telling you these things. You have hardly told me anything. How do you know there's a place on her right arm where she doesn't feel anything? Because, because when I'm kissing her arm, she makes all these cute little noises. You know, she likes it. She goes, she keeps yeah. saying, don't stop, Maddie. Well, go on. Well, well, well the first time I, I, I did it, you know, starting with the fingers, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, I got almost to her elbow, and all of a sudden she says, why did you stop? She was very annoyed, you see. She said, why did you stop? Well, why did you? I didn't. I didn't. That's what I'm telling you. She's got this place below her elbow where she can't feel me kissing her. 
Last time I saw you, you said that witches sometimes have a place on their bodies where they don't feel pain. Now, you remember that? Yeah, I remember. And I asked you, did that mean they couldn't feel pleasure, too? And you said you suppose so? Well, I thought I'd make sure. So next time, instead of kissing her, I started giving her little bites. Bites? Well, I mean, not enough to really hurt. Uh, not much, anyway. Oh, she loved it. Well, more like nibbles, really. <clears throat> I see. Oh, Mildred was crazy about it. She kept saying, don't stop, Maddie. Just like before. And then the same thing happened. When you got to just below her elbow. Yes, I got to the same place just below her elbow. And all of a sudden she said, why did you stop, Maddie? Fred, I couldn't believe it. I simply couldn't believe it. So I gave her an extra hard bite. Huh? Fred, she didn't feel it. Well, I'll be here. Fred, you think she's a witch? Uh, well, how... How do I know? Well, you said one spot that didn't feel pain. I don't know if that's true, Matthew. Hester told me that. Well, I... I've got to know. What do you have to know? Well, because I do. I mean, thing to marry a girl 20 years younger, but then to find out she's a witch, I mean... I mean, it's spooky. Yeah, yeah. Look, I'll, I'll tell you what, Matt. Why don't you ask Hester? I can't talk to Hester about my own wife. Well, just tell her that you've gotten interested in witches. Well, won't she think that's kind of peculiar? Witches are her favorite subject. She'll, she'll love talking to you about all that stuff. Well, I hope that's all it is, stuff. Go on. Go talk to her now. Right now? Yeah, I think she's back from lunch. Yes, she is. You want me for something, Doctor? Uh, no, but Mr. Parker does. He wants to ask you a few questions. Well, fine. Go ahead, Matthew. Okay, okay. Well, what can I do for you, Mr. Parker? Well, uh, Esther, uh, uh, Fred tells me <clears throat> you're interested in, um, in witches and that sort of thing. Well, I'm interested in witchcraft, yes. It's a, it's a fascinating subject. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Have, uh, have you ever known a witch? I think I've known several. Uh, well, tell me, did they, uh, did they have places on their bodies that, uh, that felt no pain? You know, no pain at all? I suspect they did. Unfortunately, I never got close enough to find out for sure. N well, that's the, uh, the, that's the ultimate test, huh, of a witch, that this completely insensitive spot? <laughs> Can it be anywhere? I mean, does it have to be in any, in any particular place or on her? I mean, on the body? Any place at all. Like an arm? Any place. Oh, I see. Uh, thanks. Thanks very much. Right. <laughs> is that all you wanted to know? Well, Hester, is that a sure sign that the person is a witch if, the, if there's this one spot that doesn't feel pain? And doesn't bleed. Oh. Doesn't bleed? That's right. No. No blood? No blood whatsoever. In that one spot, of course. Oh, thank you, Hester. Thank you very much. How are you leaving? I can tell no, you. No, no, that, that's enough for today, Hester. Thank you very much. Oh. <laughs> Mr. Parker left? Oh. oh, yes, he left. He, uh, find out everything he wanted to know? <laughs> well, it wasn't much. I, I thought for a minute he was really interested in witches. There's so much I could have told him. It would have been a pleasure. But uh, all he wanted to know was... About the place on a witch's body that feels no pain and, and doesn't bleed. You coming to bed, Mildred? In a minute, Maddie. I've got a stomachache. Well, maybe you ought to see a doctor. Well, you know how I feel about doctors. Yes, I know, I know. But, now, don't worry. My stomach will be all right in a minute. It's getting better all the time. Now... Just let me concentrate. There. It's gone. All gone. Move over, darling. You, uh, you sure you're all right? I'm fine. What'll it be tonight? Kisses or nibbles? Huh. Oh, which would you rather? Nibbles. Oh, I love those little bites. They get me all excited. Okay. Oh. First the fingers. Uh, one little finger. Mm. <laughs> Two little fingers. Mm. <laughs> Three little fingers. Oh, that's lovely. Don't stop. A little hand. Mm. Little wrist. Oh, yes. Little arm. Oh, yes. Don't stop. I said that. Why do you 
Oh, Mildred, forgive me for what I'm about to do. What are you going to do, Mary? I already did it. Did what? You didn't feel it. Feel what? And you didn't bleed. Uh, is he here? Oh, Mr. Parker, well, what's the matter? I gotta talk to him, I gotta talk to him. Is he here? Oh, the doctor's at the hospital. Office hours don't start till nine, Mr. Uh. Parker. What's the matter? Oh, here, come sit down. What? You look awful. I feel awful. I feel terrible. You want me to get you a glass of water? No, no, Hester, don't leave me. Stay with me. Mr. Parker, what is it? Hester, can I trust you? Well, of course you can trust me, but what is it? I was going to talk to Dr. Caporato, but if he won't be here till nine, I can't wait that long. I could hardly wait till morning. I snuck out of bed at six o'clock. Oh, Hester, can I talk to you? Well, of course you can talk to me. About my wife. I feel so disloyal talking about her, but I've got to. You can talk to me. Believe me, you can. Hester, I think my wife is a witch. Oh? I'm practically positive. What makes you think so? Now, first, it was the way she made my warts go away. You knew about that? The doctor told me. Then the way she makes all her own pains and things go away. Well, just last night she had a terrible stomach ache, really awful, but she applied her subconscious will to it and it went away. Just like that. Witches can do that. That and more. Well, I wouldn't have left her to come here if it hadn't gone away. I, I mean, I wouldn't have, no matter what she said, but she said she was fine, so I came. You think she's a witch just because her stomach ache got better? Oh, no, 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 that's not all. Oh, well, what else? Well... You remember when I was here the last time? You told me that a witch's body had a place on it that felt no pain? That's true. And that... that didn't bleed? Yes. Well, Mildred has a place like that. Well, how do you know? I know. Because I bit her. You bit her? Oh, yeah. You just walked up to her and, and bit her? No, not exactly, but I... I bit her. I bit her. Hard. Well, how did you know where to bite? Hester, please, never mind. I can't go into all that, not with you. But I knew where to bite, and I bit, and she didn't feel it, and she didn't bleed. Not one little drop of blood. Well. I mean, it scared me so. I, I couldn't make love to her. I told her I had a headache. She wanted to concentrate on it and make it go away, but I told her no. I wanted to keep it. That made her mad. Oh, naturally. Oh, Hester. What am I going to do? Well, what do you want to do? Well, I can't stay married to a witch. Witches can be very nice, you know. Well, I'd always be looking at her and thinking, holy cow, she's a witch. Matthew, oh, may I call you Matthew? Oh, certainly. We've known each other so long. Look, Matthew, witches are people, flesh and blood people. The magical power they have only means they have a, a greater grasp on reality than, than other people. They have greater use of their extrasensory powers. Real flesh and blood? Of course. You see, witches live on the higher levels of consciousness, that's all. Well, I, I'm trying to get used to the idea. Oh, once you do, you'll, you'll love it. Huh? Well, I guess I'd better go home. Oh, must you? Do, do you think I should tell Mildred I know she's a witch? I wouldn't. It's possible that she doesn't even know it herself. Yeah, she is very young. Maybe she hasn't found out. Yeah, I, I'd better go home. She really had a terrible stomachache last night. Oh. You know, for a witch, she certainly gets a lot of aches and pains, more than I do, really. Well, she's only human, Matthew. Well, thanks, Hester, for talking to me. It, it, it helped a lot. Oh, I'm glad. Here, let me take you to the door. Oh, I'm all right. I'm all right, really. Oh, sure you are. Uh, uh, thanks again. I, I'll be fine now. Who's that? Who? Where? Crossing the street. Why, it's Mildred. Well, is she coming here? Yeah, it yeah, looks like it. She looks like she's in a hurry. She shouldn't cross the street in the middle of the block. That's right. No, she's up. Mildred! Mildred, look out! The truck! Look out for the truck, Mildred! Anybody want to take the witch test? I know my face bleeds because I cut it while shaving this morning. And it both hurt and bled. But there's all that other flesh that covers the rest of my poor old body. Would you have me go over it every inch with even the tiniest of pins? Thank you, but no. I have other things to do, and frankly, I'm not keen on finding out. Not unless there's a guarantee that I won't wind up under the wheels of a fast-moving truck. 
We'll come back shortly with Act Three. Poor Matthew. Poor 40-year-old Matthew, who married Mildred, a 20-year-old witch. Poor Mildred, who could make warts vanish and dispel her own aches and pains by sheer force of concentration, but who died suddenly and carelessly, albeit painlessly, under the wheels of a two-ton truck. What price being a witch? What price being the widower of a witch? Well, I can't tell you how much I appreciate this, Fred. You know, the two of you coming over here for dinner. Oh, how, how's the steak, by the way? No, oh, it's great. <laughs> Marvelous. Mm, you two are about the closest friends I've got now. You're the only ones who knew about Mildred. I mean, knew all about her. I'm, I'm really very grateful to you both. Uh, don't mention it, Matthew. We're happy to be here. Oh, you know, this is the first time I've seen anybody. Anybody at all since Mildred got run over. I, I, I've been in shock. Well, who can blame you? Where was the second sight witches are supposed to have? She didn't even see the truck, and, and it was a big one. Second sight? Doesn't mean sight with the bodily eyes, Matthew. Well, it should, I think. Well, the thing I don't understand is what she was doing on my street. Did she have any friends on my street? No, Fred, that's just it. Our friends lived over in our part of town. Mm-hmm. Well, then what was she doing there? Well, it looked to me as though she was coming to see you. And she crossed the street right smack in the middle of the block. Yeah, directly opposite to your office. That's how we happened to see the whole terrible thing. She, she looked as though she was in an awful hurry. She didn't look to the right or to the left. Just put her head down and charged across the street right in front of this huge truck. Hmm. Why should she be coming to see me? You think maybe she knew you were there? She didn't know I was still seeing you. Well, then Why? She, she couldn't have been shopping in my neighborhood. There aren't any stores. It's got to be that she was coming to consult me professionally. It's got to be. No, Mildred wouldn't do that. Mildred took care of her own aches and pains. Well, maybe this time she couldn't. Well, she'd had a stomach ache the night before. Was it a bad stomach ache, Matthew? Oh, it was pretty bad. Pretty but bad. she got over it. She didn't take anything for it. Mildred? Mildred would never take anything for anything. She just concentrated and the pain went away. Mm hmm. Well, maybe it did. Oh, yes, yes. She was fine in just a few minutes, and she was fine the next morning. Pain isn't always a curse, you know. Pain is a signal that something's wrong. If we didn't have pain, how would we know something was wrong? Well, it's our thinking that's wrong. That's what Mildred said. So when she had a pain, she, she changed her thinking. Sounds so simple. Yeah, for her it was. No, nope. I'm not satisfied. Matthew, I want your permission to do an autopsy on your dead wife. An autopsy? Yeah. I want to have her body exhumed and do an autopsy. Well, will they let you do that? With your permission. I think I can get her father's. Yes, but what excuse will you give? Oh, that there's a possibility she was... Well, maybe ill, maybe incapacitated before the truck hit her, something like that. Do I have your permission, Matthew? Well, I... Hester, should I say yes? Well, I think you should. But look at it this way. It'll be the first autopsy ever performed on a known witch. Hello, Matthew. Hello, Hester. And how are you? Oh, I'm not too good. Oh, I'm sorry. Is anything wrong? In particular, I mean? Oh, I miss Mildred. Well, of course you do. You know, it's a funny thing. I was a bachelor all my life. I mean, I was 40 when Mildred and I got married, and we, we weren't married very long. You'd think I could just go back to being single. Well, I guess it doesn't work out that way. No, not for me. The only really good time I've had since Mildred died was the night you and Fred came to dinner. Oh, that was very nice. Did you really enjoy it? I know I'm not much of a cook. Oh, I loved it. Well, good, good. Uh, maybe we could do it again sometime. Uh, look, uh, 
How would you like to come to my place for dinner? I'm a very good cook. Or so I'm told. Say, I'd like that. I, 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 I'd I, like that a lot. Oh, uh, sometime next week? Uh, or this week? Tomorrow night? Great, great. And, and look, we won't talk about Mildred at all, okay? Oh, if that's the way you want it. Well, sure. I, I, I've got to forget all about her and, and her being a witch and all that. You think Fred's done the autopsy yet? I'm darned if I know why he wanted to do that. Well, he was curious about... Why a witch like Mildred would be coming to see a doctor? Well, I don't know why I said, okay, go ahead, and then why her father said, okay. Matthew, Mildred's father knew. Hmm? Knew what? That Mildred was a witch. No. Well, he suspected something. He knew she had these self-healing powers ever since she was a little girl. Now, she'd fall, skin her knee, and then she'd go off somewhere by herself and... In a couple of hours, it would be all healed. Can all witches do that? Not all witches choose to do that. Some witches choose to do other things. Like what? Oh, like seeing into other people's minds. Reading their thoughts? Oh, what's so bad about that? We all have the same thoughts, more or less. Well, I don't want anybody reading mine. I wouldn't care if you read mine. Oh, I... I wouldn't do that. Why not? Well, I just wouldn't. You could, if you tried. No, I, I, I wouldn't try. Listen, why didn't Mildred cure her father of anything? Tell me that. She cured my warts. Her father didn't choose to be cured. Not by witchcraft. <laughs> he was afraid of witchcraft. He chose to come here instead. Why wasn't I afraid? Oh, well, for one thing, you were in love. And for another... Yeah? What's the other thing? I think you'd better find that out for yourself. Coming. Oh, hello, Fred. Hello, Matthew. Come on in, come on in. Thanks. Uh, I was just going to have a drink. Would you join me? Okay. Good, good. Hey, what brings you here? Not that I'm not glad to see you. I wasn't looking forward to drinking alone. But, <laughs> you know, it took me long enough to get married, but now that I've been married, I I don't care too much for being alone. Here you go. Here's your drink. Oh, thank you. I don't suppose you could stay for dinner, could you? I've got plenty. Uh, no, my, my wife's expecting me. Oh, that's too bad. Well, but you're lucky you got a wife. Yeah, I know. You know something? This morning when I was having breakfast and reading the paper, I got so darn lonely, I just started to cry. I didn't even know I was crying, but all of a sudden I, I couldn't read the words, not not even the headlines. I ran out of this place so fast, I, I, I went over to see you. Yeah, Hester told me you were there. Uh, Hester and I had a nice talk. It picked me up a lot. Oh, and you know what? She's going to cook dinner for me. Well, that's nice. Tomorrow night. I, I'm looking forward to that. And Fred, you know what she told me? She said Mildred's father has known all along that she was a witch or that there was something, well, odd about her, you know, self-healing powers ever since she was a kid. Yeah, that's right. That's why he agreed to the autopsy. Oh, yeah, the, the autopsy. Yes, I, uh, I've got the results. Yeah? Matthew, your wife had a ruptured appendix. You mean... But she said it was just a stomach ache. Well, she was wrong. But, Fred, she made the pain go away. She told me so. She was telling the truth. Well, it must have come back then. And this time, she couldn't make it go away. She panicked. Her witch's powers failed her. Well, let's say she just overextended them. And she was on her way to see you. Peritonitis had set in. She might easily have died even if the truck hadn't hit her. Oh, poor Mildred. Yeah. Like I told you, Matthew, um, pain does have its uses. Or what are doctors for? Hester, I want to help. Now, there must be something I can do to help, huh? Well, now, you, um... Oh, you want to peel the potatoes? Sure. <laughs> well, just sit down here. All right. Here's the potatoes. Mm -hmm. Oh, peel about four. Uh-huh. Here's a knife, and here's a lovely paper bag for the peelings. Okay. 
Hey, you know, this is great, sitting in your kitchen, peeling potatoes and everything. <laughs> you know something? Hmm? It's good that we're sort of the same age. Don't you think so, Hester? I mean, Mildred was so darn young. Boy, was she ever young. Of course, that made her attractive in a way, but in another way, it didn't. I mean, you never heard her talk, but she had this sort of squeaky voice. I used to think it was cute, but I don't know. I mean, I think after a while, it might have gotten on my nerves. Now, you, on the other hand, have a very well-modulated voice. <laughs> Do I? Maybe Mildred talked that way from being a witch. Oh, I don't think so. No? Matthew, you must understand that witches are not, uh, are not harpies or hags or conjurers or shamans. I mean, they are quite simple, ordinary people, really. Only they... Well, they maintain contact with the deepest powers we possess. Other people lose that contact, but witches hold on to it. Uh, contact with what, Hester? Mm -hmm. With the unconscious mind, Matthew. With that reservoir of strength and passion and feeling. With the simple, uncomplicated drives to fight, to conquer, to possess. To love and be loved. Well, is that what it's like? Down there, in the unconscious. Oh, don't you feel it is? Oh, yes. Yes, I do. You see? Hester, I want to conquer you. I, I, I want to possess you. I want to love you, and you should love me. Oh, I do love you, Matthew. You do? I always have. Well, you never told me. I wanted you to find out for yourself. Well, say. <laughs> I, I think I better get back to peeling the potatoes. <laughs> this is all kind of kind of overwhelming. Oh, darling, you'll, you'll get used to it. Uh, Matthew, hey, look what you've done. What have I done? Uh, what's this? What's what? Well, here on the table. Oh, I don't know. What is it? Well, I, I believe it's the tip of your thumb. Well, yeah, this the... The tip of my thumb? Give me your hand. Your left hand. Uh, Here, put the potato down. What? Here, there. You see? You, you, you've cut off the tip of your thumb. Well, how'd I do that? Well, when did I do it? When did I do it? Oh, a few minutes ago. Hester, it isn't bleeding. There's no blood. Not a drop. But that's impossible. I... No. It's not impossible, is it? Not for us witches, it isn't. Us witches? Nothing is impossible for us witches. You too? <laughs> Me too. Oh, darling, don't look so unhappy. Witches are just like ordinary people. Only better. <laughs> Witches are just like ordinary people, only better. You know, that sets me to thinking. Not always, but at various times, I have felt that I was, well, uh, far from ordinary. The feeling never lasted very long, but while I had it, it was very intense. Could it be? Oh, no. And yet, and yet, perhaps it's true. I am a witch. And you? How about you? I'll be back shortly. Is it possible we're all witches? Do we all have secret powers? Untapped powers that we ourselves do not recognize? Of course it's possible. Beginning right now, I'm going to develop mine. And I'll keep in touch. I'll tell you from time to time how I'm doing. The only thing is, I don't quite know how to start. Our cast included William Redfield, E.V. Juster, Bryna Rayburn, and Kurt Benson. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Now, a preview of our next tale. He's pulling away from the curb. I'm okay. That doesn't mean he's after us. Wait! He's following us. Now, don't panic. Maybe he's heading someplace else. Where? This road leads away from town. There's nothing for more than 80 miles. He's after us. Why? I, 
I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? You know everything. Shut up. He's after us. Look, he's gaining on us. I'll lose him. He wants us. Oh, hold the wheel. Hold, oh hold the wheel steady. Steer. Don't shoot at him. I've got a cannibal. He has no. the radio yet. I can no, stop him. No, don't. Steer to the right. No. Hold the car steady. Oh, This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. G. Marshall. It's only human, I expect, to envy the wealthy, the successful, the newsworthy. Yes, all these advantages are something to be a little jealous of, but only up to a point. Beyond that, a host of problems, very different from ours, and far more disturbing and deadly, haunt the fabulously rich, the superstar, the headline maker. Could you imagine, for example, this happening to you, or your sister, or your daughter? Go ahead in, Bill. After you, Senator. Have a look at this package. I found it waiting with the mail when I got home. Italy. Postmark Naples. You want me to open the box? You're younger and tougher than I am. I don't think it'll make you throw up. finger with a ring on it. Jake's ring. Jake's finger. We can check the print, but I know it's his. But this came from Naples. Your daughter Lynn's supposed to be in Rome. Why would... You think Jake is dead? I don't know. I don't even know if Lynn is still alive. <laughs> mystery drama, See Naples and Die, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Michael Wager. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Senator Henry Chalmers Winstead, born 1918, of a wealthy and distinguished family, which contained in its history one secretary of the treasury, eight congressmen, several judges. Senator Winstead, chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee, and certainly his party's nominee to run for the next president of the United States. A man to be envied? Let's find that out from someone who knows him perhaps best of all, Bill Desmond. When the senator calls, I jump. He's that kind of man. He never orders, just asks. You never refuse. Not out of fear or ambition, out of respect, admiration. And if you'll accept the word in its proper context, love. That's why I was there looking with a churning stomach at that grisly present from Naples and listening to the phone ring. I want you to listen in on this, Bill. Take it in my study. But don't let her know she's being monitored. Senator, if it's Lynn, I don't... Please, Bill. Everything I have in the world may be at stake. Okay, sir, I'm I'm with you. Uh, This is Senator Winstead. I want to talk to Miss Beth Chalmers. If there's any question, tell her that her father insists on talking to her. I 
hurried into the senator's study and picked up his extension quietly without any telltale click. You learn a lot about that sort of thing these days in Washington. They just started to talk. Lynn? Yes, Daddy? There really isn't anything funny about this, Lynn. Why did you refuse to take my call? Well, I thought you might be some smart aleck reporter that has... What's the phrase of choice today? Cracked my cover. Blown it. Oh, is that all? What else? Where are you, Dad? In Washington. Was something wrong? You can tell me that in person. I want you home on the next plane. Lynn, did you hear me? How could I miss? So did most of Rome. May I ask you why I'm being bullied like a witness before one of your subcommittees? If it hadn't been for special circumstance, I wouldn't have been soft enough to allow you to go barging around Europe alone and... Well, confounded, I really despise the word. Incognito. <laughs> but it's such a lovely word. It's so romantic. It's my affair. The word I get from my sources is exactly that. Affair. Daddy, I'm 25 years old. Isn't that way beyond the time it's anyone else's business? Vittorio Tedesco is a criminal. Why? He's been cited by one of my subcommittees for income tax evasion. <laughs> Who isn't these days? Well, now, that's pretty childish for 25, Lynn. And you're pretty damn self-righteous. How'd you feel if Vic and I came on home and got married? You'd do me a favor. Bring him. The moment he sets foot on U.S. soil, he'll be indicted for income tax evasion, and that's only the beginning. You don't know Vic, Dad. I think you've been witch hunting too long. What I'm you... beginning to feel is that I'm hunting one right now. You get yourself home here alone, or I'll come and get you. With Congress in session? Aren't you afraid the country would fall apart without you? I... I'm sorry, Daddy, but you can't make me jump like all the disciples anymore. I'm going to do what you did. I'm going to make my own life. Don't you hang up on me. Mom left me independent. You brought me up to be that way. Nobody knows who I am here, and, and I'm about to get out of your way for good, and I won't surface till you have everything you want. Ciao. Lynn? Lynn? Damn it. Bill, you're still on? Yes, sir. Better get in here. What we need is a council of war. <laughs> Why didn't you tell her? What about Jake? She had no idea I sent Jake off to keep an eye on her. But we're not going to sit here and do nothing. Well, of course not. There's more to that box than, than that obscenity I showed you. Here, read this. I find your daughter irresistible. Also, fortunately, she feels the same way about me. Since I feel I'm a little old for her, I hope we never have to use that lever... Why don't you let me go right over now and take care of that dirty... That's what I want, Bill. But I couldn't be the one to suggest it. Maybe we'd be better off just hollering copper. Finish the note. What evidence, what proof do we have? Well, the note came with a finger, didn't it? Oh, no. Completely separately. Read. I think you might want to reach me after you read this. Any evening between 12 and 1 a.m., Washington time, I will try to reach you at Rose's hideaway. The phone is safe. Marriage, naturally, is not the only option. Unless we can make a bargain. I hope Jake put his finger on that. No signature. And typed. And no doubt who it's from. Vittorio Tedesco. Yes. What's his price? Quash the income tax indictment against him, I suppose. Could you? I can't, in all honesty. Are you even considering this proposition? <sighs> Jake Muldoon was my sergeant at the invasion of truck. If it hadn't been for his hand in the way, a Japanese bayonet would have cut my throat. My daughter is all I have left from a family that once had a wife and two sons as well. I lost them all to violence. Ellen to cancer. Jim and Grant in two wars, Korea and Vietnam. I have no family left but Lynn. 
And you and Jake. What else can I do? Push the button. Call in everyone, including the Marines. Well, it's a consideration. Except they already have Jake, but not Lynn. You heard the phone call, Bill. I can't stop Lynn from marrying that gangster if she wants to. Now, it would raise such a smell, your whole candidacy would go out the window. I can't quash the indictment against him, nor would I even try. Except for Lynn. Oh, Lord. What am I going to do, Bill? Stall. What good can that do? Give me time to fly to Italy. 48 hours. Oh, risk my last friend. I don't know. Bring it all out in the open is the right way for me. No. Not till you take that phone call. The witching hour. Well, let's head for the witch at Rose's hideaway and check out just what Tedesco really expects to get. Senator Winstead, in spite of his prominence and enormous know-how, is a babe in arms when it comes to the dirty work. That's my department. I was halfway to being a lawyer when my folks tangled with a truck. There was only enough insurance to bury them. And I had a kid sister and brother to bring up, so I became a cop. Eight years later, my kid sister and brother were independent, and under the police program, I got my lawyer's degree. While I was getting it, I met Lynn Winstead and her father. It was a case of love at first sight all the way around. What we all should have had was second sight. To see where it was leading us. Don't be shy, fellas. Just waltz on in. This is a friendly inferno. And just super hell for kicks. The door on the left's my office. Just head for there. I'm Rose, Senator. I was expecting you, not the BF. But this is my administrative assistant, Bill Desmond. I don't go for counsels. Except on your side. No rods in here. I have a license for it, Rosebud. Well, don't let my name at a club fool you, Mac. I wanted to, I could take it away from you. No need. We're only here for a phone call. The senator, not you. Bill is in on all of this. I brought him in. I don't know, but hold it. Just remember, this is my territory. No funny moves. Like otherwise, the morning paper gets a tip. Senator Winstead was frequenting a gay bar. You forget it, Bill. Yeah. No, that's fine. Put it through. Then switch it on my office phone. A certain party looking to reach you, Senator. Now, the next time this phone rings, he'll be on the line from overseas. You want to tell your bully boy here to join me at the bar for a drink? So as you can have some privacy? Think I'll be safe? As long as you're under Mother Rose's wing. Go with him, Bill. I'll take the call. But I want Bill if I need him. You hear that? Yes, sir. We'll handle him with TLC. Tender loving care, sir. It's the uh, nurse's credo. But it'd better be the way you're handled. Hello? A call from Naples? It's your call, Senator. Come on, Desmond. Who's talking? I don't have to ask who you are. The voice is enough identification. You really have to ask who I am? No, but can we stop the games? As you've set it up, there's no way this phone call can be monitored. That was the idea. So let's not waste time. Jake, are you all right? I'd have thought your daughter would be your first concern. She is. If you've got her, you gave me proof enough you have Jake. Let's cut your worries. I have them both, Senator. Jake against his will, as you can imagine. Your daughter, that's another story. What do you want, Tedesco? I want back to America. My skirt's clean. That income tax evasion judgment reversed. I want to be a free citizen, and you can do it. And if I can't? I'll send you your friend Jake piece by piece. I'll marry your daughter and make sure you couldn't be elected dog catcher. I, um, need time. How do I get in touch with you? I'll call here tomorrow and the day after. Same time. If you're not there 48 hours from now. Well, I sent you Jake's finger because I wanted to be sure you understood we weren't playing any games. I'd hate to get into the same sort of thing with your daughter. But I, uh, 
I have too much at stake to have any scruples. You'll have my answer within 48 hours. If you feel you must wait. But what else can it be? This wouldn't or couldn't happen to you. Or me. Ordinary people are not called upon to make extraordinary decisions normally. But how will Senator Henry Chalmers Winstead react? Which of his lives, public or private, is the more important? We'll return shortly with Act Two. It's been a sleepless night for Bill and the Senator. And seven precious hours are gone before the senator has finally agreed to let Bill fly to Rome. It's a slim chance because Lynn has already checked out of her hotel with no forwarding address. Now, waiting at the airport to catch the first plane out, Bill is joined unexpectedly at the airport. What are you doing here, Senator? I threw a little weight around last night and dug up the number Tedesco called from. Naples. Uh, Spezia 54368. Got it. I should be going myself. Oh, sure. They'd spot you for sure. And some smart reporter would have a headline like Daughter's Torch Lights Fire Under Senator Winstead by Fiddling Around in Rome. You can't afford to lose a nomination with publicity like that. I can't afford to lose a daughter. You're not going to. And neither am I. <laughs> I just discovered I'm still carrying my torch. I must really love her when I can even think of forgiving her for falling for a crook like that. Don't underestimate him. He's a very charming man. He's a crook. I talk about his manners, you, his morals. The only thing we ever could get him on was tax fraud. Why didn't we grab him in time? A lot of mistakes, Bill. Why didn't you grab Lynn when you could have? <laughs> no guts. My daughter scared you? Enough. But not all the way. You. Me? You're a large legend to live up to, Senator. Anyone in your family lives in a glass cage, which isn't much protection. How do you expect to locate Lynn? I'm heading for that Spezia telephone number in Naples. I got some channels of my own. Watch your step, Bill. He fights dirty. So do I. I came from the same slums. <laughs> Flight was a milk run, but Rome was strictly a washout. So I took the rapid over Naples. A Spezia phone number turned out to be a waterfront joint called Tia Maddalena. Bingo. Right off the bat, Lynn was sitting at a table with Vic. I was headed for them when about 220 pounds of muscle and tuxedo got in my way. Buonasera, signore. E benvenuta a Tia Maddalena. I am Guillermo. The senor wishes to sit at the bar. The senor wishes to join Mr. Tedesco. You are a friend of his? I know, the ladies. Ah, but the evening is warm. Tonio, take his coat. <laughs> Don't try to move, amigo. Just a little, what you call it, precaution. A frisk. Old American custom. Guillermo... You can call me Willie. Let him go, Tony. He's clean now. The all-American type. Thanks for making me feel at home. I can find my own way. Thanks. <laughs> Beth Chalmers. Imagine bumping into you. Bill. I hope I'm not breaking up anything or something like that. No, no, not at all, uh, Bill, Senor. Bill, how, how did you... Oh, excuse me, Vic. This is an old friend of the family, Bill Desmond. Vic Tedesco. How are you, Mr. Desmond? Do you uh, expect to be in Naples long, Senor Desmond? Oh, no, I just came here to pick up a couple of packages. I hope to get the first train out. Oh. Well, we were just going to have a brandy. Will you join us? Oh, I don't think that... Uh... Matter of fact, I was going to ask... Beth to join me in a dance. Why don't you, Beth? Oh, you sure you don't mind, Vic? No, 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 not at all. All right. As a matter of fact, I have some business to attend to. Please, enjoy yourselves. But I'll, uh, I'll be jealous of every moment you're away, Carissima. 
I uh, expect to marry La Signorina. So treat her very carefully, huh? you to get out of here. Just as soon as you do. Oh, I'm not leaving. So be a good little bird dog and stick your tail between your legs and run back to Dad and tell him it's no good. I agree. The whole thing stinks. I don't want to talk about it. Then why are you dancing with me? Well, I was afraid you'd tell Vic who I really am. He knows, knucklehead. He knows. No, he doesn't. He thinks... Where are you taking me? The terrace. Out! I'm not going. That's what you think. Bill, you hurt me just now. What do you think you're doing to your father? Dad? He can take care of himself. He's above us all in an ivory tower. And don't talk to me about his career. For 25 years, that's all I've ever lived. My father's life. Never my own. I've had to fight off charlatans, lounge lizards, fortune hunters, and social climbers. And as for any real man... The very thought of trying to live up to my father has turned them off. You ought to know that. Well, it didn't turn Vic off because he doesn't know who I am. I'm just the girl he loves. Can't you understand that? For once I know I'm loved for myself alone. Oh, Lynn, what do you use for a brain? He doesn't love you. He just wants to use you. How? To blackmail your father. Oh, he'll be ridiculous. He doesn't know who my father is. And Vic doesn't need money. He's got all the money. It isn't the money he wants. Then what? He needs your father's influence. To suppress the evidence against him on an income tax indictment. What are you trying to do to me, Bill? I'm just trying to get it through your fat head. That if I thought you were dancing. Enjoying the view? Not particularly. Not what I'm looking at, anyway. Now, that's not very polite. Apparently, Mr. Desmond doesn't care for me. I suppose he's been trying to tell you what a monster I am. Oh, it doesn't matter what he's been saying, because I don't believe him. You might as well know that that once I gave Mr. Desmond the gate, and he seems to be suffering from a bad case of sour grapes. Oh, well, Beth, I'm sorry. Don't let him spoil our evening, huh? It's already spoiled. I'd like to go back to my hotel, please. I'll go along with you and see that you get packed. I think you have a train to catch, Mr. Desmond. Guillermo, friend of la señora Macasino, a quid de la con l'altro, eh? Si. Guillermo will take you to the train. Now, just a minute. I brought to your coat and the package you checked. Okay, Willie, don't crowd me. I know when I'm licked. Arrivederci, Beth. The word for us in Italian, or... Or any other language is goodbye. Come on, Vic. Oh, don't you worry. I won't let you out of my sight again. In Italian, she meant addio, Mr. Desmond. I always wanted a trench coat like this here. Yeah. Good all-purpose coat and real handy for covering a gunner. Which is covering you, so uh, let's just play it cool, huh? And why not, Willie? My girl just stood me up. You and me can go steady now. A clown. That's me, Willie. Always good for a laugh. So, which way to the warehouse? You speak Italian, huh? I know a magazine ain't no train. Down the steps to the end of the terrace. And just take it easy. I wouldn't want a cold take here. I like the view better from up on the terrace. Yeah, real pretty town. I was born in Napoli. You like the place? My most favorite. What is it they say? See Naples and die. Like I said, a clown. Now, just slide in easy, under the wheel, and back into the corner. Okay. Now, cross your hands and put them up there above the dashboard. Well, that's a good boy. And now, you move one finger, and I put a bullet in your gut. Is that what you did with Jake Muldoon? Nope. With him, we just removed the finger. <laughs> That's a hot one, ain't it? Funny, Willie. Real funny. I guess the real clown is you. Bill Desmond. Well, glory be to God, ain't you the sight for sore eyes? Jake Muldoon. Okay, Jake, you got company. Why don't the two of you have a party? 
See you for breakfast in the morning. What are you doing here? We got your message, Chick. How's the hand? Oh, I can get along without the finger. But I won't be able to wear the ring anymore. It was Sheila's class graduation. God rest her soul. Don't worry. The senator has the ring. What about Lynn? Oh, I'm so ashamed of myself the way I was taken. Right now, I'm more ashamed of Lynn the way she's let herself be taken. Have you seen her? I have. Maybe I shook her up a little. How do we get out of this, Jake? What do you mean the room? I don't see no way. We're four floors up, and there's only that skylight I can't reach. And the angle is so steep, you'd never be able to climb to the roof. This uh, window. Uh, you see the crossbars outside? I can see something else. What? There's a pole for the power lines not so far off. If I could get out the skylight, I might be able to jump to it. Yeah, it has foot braces all the way down. We'll try it. We'll need this table. Me on top, and you on top of me. I may have a bad hand, but I still have a good pair of shoulders. But I'm not going to leave you behind, Jake. Since I lost my Sheila two years ago, there's only been the senator, you, and his little girl. I'm expendable, Bill, like we used to say in the forces. Well, this isn't the army, Jake. At least they had a kind of decency. There's none here. And I'm looking to do more than try to rescue Lynn from her own pig-headedness. I want to nail that over sex godfather at the same time. You think I ain't with you on that? Do you know where Lynn is staying here in Naples? Well, sure. Digging that out was what got me nabbed. Okay. Now, if I can just get out of here, I think maybe I could get us all out of this. Including the senator. If Lynn will cooperate. <laughs> she always walked in your footsteps and worshipped the dust blew out of them. <laughs> Not for some time. Sure. She was only waiting to be asked back. And when you didn't, what would she do but tempt you a little to get your dander up? Well, maybe you're right. Get up on the table, Jake. Here. I'll help. Uh, Brace yourself against uh, the wall. I am. Can you close your good hand over the other wrist? Okay, give me a lift up. Uh, I'm going up on your shoulders. Uh, Hang on. Uh, Let's see. You got it open? Yeah. I can get up on the frame and jump for the pole. How are you getting me up there? I'm not. Huh? You couldn't make the jump, not with that hand. Anyway, I've got to come back tonight and be here in the morning. If my scheme works. Give me the hotel address and the room number. It's a long jump. Suppose you don't make it. To coin an old Air Force joke, you'll just have to repeat slowly over me. Our Father who art in heaven. <laughs> Classic escape. Will the hero's desperate leap bring him safety? Or will he smash to death on the cobblestones 40 feet below? Except that isn't the real question in this story. What has to be saved is the career of a senator who aspires to the highest honor his country can offer. I'll return shortly with Act Three. It's the old analogy of the snowball or the dominoes, the chain reaction. A man with no integrity uses a lever to force a man of integrity to give in to his demands. When he doesn't, the man with no scruples goes further and further to win what he wants. While Bill Desmond is risking his life to save the senator's future, Lynn, the girl he loves, is finding out what risk her headstrong selfishness has put her in. Vic, if you really love me, let's pack up right now. Let's go home and get married. Hey, 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 subito, pigeon. What do we do about your father? What does that mean? Uh, how long do we have to keep up the pretense, huh? Beth? Or shall I say the real name? Lynn Winstead. So you do know who I am. Oh, your ex Amour gave it away. That isn't true. You've known from the beginning, haven't you? Suppose I have. So Bill was right. You've just been using me. You think my father can quash the indictment against you. Like that. And look who all do we eyed on me, Angel. Those things are done every day. A business proposition. Give a little, take a little. We're done, you mean. 
I'm growing up fast. I was fool enough to think it was only me you were interested I in. I was. I am. Don't sell it short. I'm getting my eyes opened all right. But I'm not kidding myself anymore. I'm not going to marry you, Vic. So? Well, I'll just have to hold you for ransom. You really are what Bill said you were. You're a gangster and a crook, and now a blackmailer. <laughs> Our names don't faze me, sugar. The means, the means are all I care about, and I got them to spare. Your father, the big Lily White Crusader with the next nomination in his pocket, and the big, big job dangled in front of him like a carrot on a stick. Well, I'm the stick, baby. I can jerk away that carrot. If he wouldn't come through for me, I love the idea of hitting back at him with those headlines. Senator Winstead's daughter, wife of exiled crook. You named me. You'll never be able to do that now. Oh, I got a lot of ways to go. I got you sewed up seven ways from nowheres, Mia Amore. I'm not going to outline them all. A couple you don't even know about, but I'm giving you a night to sleep on it. Now, you get in touch with your old man and close his papers on me, or he's going to find out he doesn't have a daughter anymore. I didn't know about all this then. I was too busy making the jump, which turned out to be easier than finding my way back to Naples and Lynn's hotel. And getting into it unnoticed. It wasn't hard to see that Vic had it well staked out. But 4,000 lira got me in the trash exit... And another odd two up the service elevator to the right floor. Not bad for under ten deflated American bucks. Who is it? You alone? Lynn? Yes? Who is it? Bill. Let me in before the house dick picks me up for a peeping Tom. Bill! It is you! Oh, but wait a minute. Oh, Bill. Oh, thank God. Oh, you don't know how glad I am. Sure, oh, how glad I am. You're, hey, listen, let's close the door before the house clerk raises the room rent. Oh, you're just the most beautiful thing I ever saw. Well, you still are the same for me. Maybe you'd better let me in on how you change your mind so fast. I uh, won't go into the next 15 minutes or hour or... Whatever it was, except that it brought us both up to date on a lot of things. Nothing new for you on my side, and nothing that really matters from Lynn until the real whopper. We've got a million things to do, but I happen to get lucky. I've got a friend who's a purser on the Majestic, which sails tomorrow from Naples for Barcelona, Lisbon, and Madrid. He's holding two staterooms for us, one for you and one for Jake and me. Now, all I've got to do is get Jake out of that warehouse. I can get by Vic's watchdogs, but we've got to figure out... Also, how to smuggle you out. And... Bill. Bill. What? It's no good. Oh, honey, this is no time to back out. If I can just get us all on board that boat safe and sound, we're all home free. No, you, me, Jake, even... Even in spite of what they did to him. But not Dad. Why not? Oh, Bill, I'm so ashamed of myself. I've been such a... A prime jerk. Such a fool. Okay, but... Now you've come to your senses. No, you don't understand. Before I came to my senses, I was in Rome, and, and Vic was in Naples, and, and there was, was some kind of court thing that kept him from going anywhere in Italy, but here... Damn good thing, kept him away from you. No, except that he kept writing me letters, and I... You... You wrote him back. Oh, what kind of letters? That's what I'm ashamed of, I... I don't know what happened to me, Bill, but I lost a lot more than my heart over here. Some of the things that that I said in those letters, I I wouldn't want anyone to see again. Not even me. And he's threatening to release them to every punk magazine and yellow rag in the U.S. if you don't get Papa to come through with clearing him. My papers for his papers. That's his threat. Lane, you are a dope. Now, what in the name of... Wait a minute. What is it? Silence, dope. A genius is at work. You're sure you understand? Yes. It's your chance to wipe everything out. Make up for every half-baked thing you've done. Think you can pull it off? I'd better. Uh-huh. Yes, but how can you trust a dope? 
Well, because that's what you've got going for you. Oh, Vic still has every reason to think you're one. Thanks. It's okay. You're my favorite, though. <laughs> so, you got Tedesco's number, huh? Yes, it's that's here. Three. No, no, I'm going to do it all by myself for once. Now, remember, not till 10 o'clock tomorrow night. I've got to get Jake and me out of the coop and have time to sneak aboard. Shh, shh, shh. Pronto. Oh, Vic. It's Lynn. Oh, hello, Lynn. Keeping pretty late hours, huh? <laughs> I just got through calling Dad. And I... I told him everything. So what do I expect? The Marine landing to rescue you? The CIA? The local politician? No, no, no. He's agreed to what you want. Everything. Only one way, baby. I want him here. I want a piece of paper from him in his handwriting with witnesses. You can have it tomorrow. How? Well, there's some... Gossip circulating around Washington about us already. So, Dad booked me a passage on the Majestic, sailing from here tomorrow night, in the name of Beth Chalmers. So, you think I'd let you leave just like that? No, Dad's flying in, secretly, later today. He's hitching a ride with the MATS, and from the military airport, he'll get down here by helicopter. He'll be in my cabin by 9 p.m. You just bring the letters with you and... And he'll make the deal. What time does the boat sail? Not till midnight. Why not my place? Oh, Vic, he, he can't take a chance. He's going to be suppressing evidence. Well, well, why should I take a chance? What chance are you taking? We're the ones. Dad and me are caught in the sleeve. We've got to keep this under wraps. Okay, baby, you got a deal. But just remember, I'm not coming alone. I'll be there with plenty of protection. Well, I'll leave visitor's passes for you at the gate. It's Pier 12, Cabin 24, A deck. 10 o'clock. Now make it four passes, and I'll be there. Oh, I've, I've been so scared. How can I thank you? I'm not coming for you, baby. I'm coming to watch the senator crawl. Coming. You brought it off. With three of his gunmen. We'll take care of them. And you. Oh, I don't know, Bill. I I feel somehow so dirty. Well, I... it's a dirty league, and this linen couldn't be washed in public. Now, I gotta get back to jail before they know I'm on the loose. See you on the boat. Oh. By the way, you have an extra pair of pantyhose you could lend me? If the situation hadn't been so tense, I could have laughed out loud at the expression on Lynn's face. But there wasn't time for anything except what had to be done. I sneaked out of the hotel the same way I got in, carrying with me the pantyhose, two oval bars of Lynn's scented soap, and a coil of rope from one of the fire stations. I spotted what looked like one of Vic's men at the back door, hid in the shadows. Until he stopped to light a cigarette, turning away into the wind. And I was around the corner and gone. Back to the warehouse and my career as a prisoner. Jake. Jake. That's you, Bill? Yeah. Look out. There's a rope coming through the skylight. Okay. Got it. Pull it tight and hitch it to something solid. I'm coming across and back in. After I got in... From Jake's shoulders, I unhitched the noose and the rope after a couple of flips from where I'd had it around one of the foot bars on the power pole. I hid it carefully under one of the beds. I'd need it later to lower Jake with his bad hand. I'd go out the same way as I had tonight. With the soap bar and the legs of the pantyhose, we had two blackjacks. We hid those safely. Now all we had to do was wait out the day and act like model prisoners. <laughs> Well, you look at the two dukes sleeping like they was babes. Hey, wake up, you bums. Oh, oh but Jono Guillermo. Okay, cut out the humor. I brought you both some grub. And this here's Tonio. He and a friend will bring you your dinner around six. Then, guess what? There's a file in the cake you baked. Like I said, a clown. This time, you ain't beating your gums. Out of the goodness of the boss's heart... You'll all be on your own tomorrow morning. Well, in case I shouldn't see you again, ciao. Come on, Tony. 
You may not see me, Willie, but you'll hear from me. Antonio heard the first bells that night as he brought our food. A bar of soap in the toe of a sock is as effective as it's safe. It worked equally well on the two uglies Vic left behind in the dock. Jake told me later. By that time, I was already in Lynn's cabin, waiting behind the door. Vic. Oh, I was afraid you wouldn't get here. Wouldn't have missed it. Ten on the nose. You have the letters? Right here. Oh, good. Then come on in. Meet my father. Got your rod, Willie? Yeah. I think we'll just let Willie check things out first, all right? Go ahead. You can trust him to keep his mouth shut. Va. Okay. There ain't nobody else here. That's what you think. The double cross. Don't move toward his gun, Desmond. I got one, too. I'd like to ram it right down your lying little throat, sweetheart. All right, now the three of us are just going to stroll out real casually. And this time, no surprises. Oh, Jake! Hey, Miss Winston. Long time no see. I don't think I hit Willie quite hard enough, Jake. Would you like to do the honors? With pleasure. <clears throat> Didn't I tell you, you ugly spalpeen, you'd be hearing from me again? <laughs> I feel as if I'd just broken out of a spider web. Nothing like a sea breeze to blow away all kinds of cobwebs. I wonder how Vic and Willie are enjoying the voyage. Are they actually under arrest? That was the whole plan. Beyond the three-mile limit, this ship becomes American soil. The grand jury issued the warrant yesterday, and technically the captain can execute that warrant now. And what about Willie? Well, he's a stowaway. And he's got a record a mile long. By the time we get home, they'll be rearrested, convicted, and clapped in jail where they belong. Let's forget about them. But how could you ever forgive me? Or forget? Well, we made up the story that your father was going to be here when he wasn't. Let's say the letters and all the rest. Never happened either. I don't deserve to get out of trouble so easily. Who said you did, lady? You don't know the trouble you're headed for. Jake, keeping a faithful watchdog's eye on them from behind a ventilator, turns away. A nice-looking couple, he's thinking. Won't the senator be pleased? And what the hell he says to himself, it was worth it all to have a finger in the pie. I'll be back shortly. By the time Lynn and Bill had gone below for a nightcap, Jake had circled around and taken their place at the rail. Putting one arm along it, he could almost feel the wraith of his own Sheila, warm and loving, nestling in it. The Lord taketh away, but the Lord giveth. Lynn and Bill were his children, and the senator was his, well, why not his father? Wasn't that the name they gave the first president? Our cast included Michael Wager, Marion Seldes, Larry Haynes, Dan Ocko, and Ken Harvey. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Now, a preview of our next tale. She was a priestess in the temple of Apollo at Delphi. And she fell in love with me. Hey, Pop Pop, you, you know the sun's getting hot out here. Maybe you ought to get in. Anyhow, you, you swallow a few grains and you go into a deep trance. And when you come to or wake up, it's hundreds of years later. Oh, rave on. Now, Pop. now make plans to break out, Augie. Quickly before they come for you. Go get your gold. Sure, get the gold. And then where do I hide? You can hide anywhere. A secluded spot, a, a cave, a forest, a, a desert. Yeah, great. And what do I do for chow? I'm trying to explain this, Augie. You don't eat. You don't drink. You don't have any wants. You, you have no needs. You're oblivious to cold, to heat, 
to rain, to, to snow. And in several hundred years, you come alive again. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. G. Marshall, and we hold these, uh, what shall we call them, meetings, adventures, seances, nightmares, usually at this time and place. So what is your terror? Are you interested in immortality? Would you like to live forever? Does the prospect of life everlasting intrigue you? Well, if it does, or even if it doesn't, stay with us. And you'll meet a gentleman who can sell you eternity. The catch? The hitch? The fine print? There isn't any. Would I lie to you? I, uh, I got all this gold. Let's make a deal. What good is gold? Gold? Gold is... Uh, uh, I is... notice you have some in your teeth. Is that what gold is used for? Let's make a deal. What is a deal? I'll give you half. No. I am not amused by gold. Come. You must go back. No. No. Come. I'm warning you. Okay, you ask for it. Come, Augie. Time to return. The bullet. The bullet, it... It just went through you. Put your toys away, Augie. And come back to your cage. Our mystery drama, A Cage for Augie Carroll, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Leon Janney. I'll be back shortly with Act One. The central character of our tale is Augie Carroll. That word character may be a misnomer, since Augie was never accused of having any. I'm afraid I must say that Augie is not a good person. As a child, he took things that belonged to others. When he grew up, he continued to practice. Of course, there was a dramatic increase in both the value of the objects and the violence of the methods. Against the wall is a stick-up. You punk! It is true, of course, that the wages of sin is death. But those are the final wages. The severance pay, so to speak. And the fact is, our Augie possesses quite a fortune. However, Augie is unable to enjoy his wealth at this point in time. There's a stumbling block. Or I should say a cell block. For a jury of his peers has awarded Augie the status of non-paying, of involuntary guest at a leading state penitentiary for the next 99 years. However, Augie is no ordinary inmate. Even here, he's a great man. And even here, he has what is known as clout. Let us meet Augie in the exercise yard of the great prison. Hold on, Augie. Hey, Augie, you need cigarettes? Okay, okay, beat it. All you guys. Except you, Pop. 
I want to talk to you, Pop. The rest of you clowns, take off. Sure, Hawk. Okay. Yeah, sit down, Pop. Take a road off your feet. What do you want with me, Hawk? You know who I am, huh? Huh, Doesn't everybody know who you are? Well, how come you never come around and see me, Pop? Why why should I do that, Augie? Come on, you're an old jail rat. Who's looking out for you, Pop? Who's uh, giving you protection? Who? Nobody. Listen, Pop. You're talking to me. Augie, Augie, I'm... I'm the oldest one in here. I I can't do anybody good. I can't do anybody harm. I I want nothing. Nobody wants anything from me. Pop, there's got to be organization. You know what I mean? I know, but I'm just out of it. Nobody's out of it. Everybody's got to be part of the organization. That's all. All right, Augie. Count me in. You got to pay your dues. Dues? Huh. I don't have a cent. Come on, Pop. You get stuff from the outside. Your folks send you cigarettes, a little dough, this and that. I don't know a soul on the outside. I'm all alone in the world. All I own are the clothes on my back. You're lying, Pop. And I don't even own those. Those belong to the state. My boys can make it rough. Augie, I'm going to die soon. I'm so tired, you, you'd be doing me a favor. Okay, okay, but the joint's got to be organized. You, you got to give me something. Like they say, uh, a token, a good face, you know? Yeah, yeah, I know. Come to think of it, I do have something. Yeah, now you're talking. Tell me, Augie, what do you want more than anything else in the world? <laughs> you nuts! Tell me. I want to bust out of here. No. No, you just say that. Because that's what every con is supposed to say. But you really don't want to break out. Yeah, how do you know? Because if you wanted to escape, you'd do it. Huh? You've done it before, but you don't want to. And I know why. Yeah? Why? You're a dead man on the outside, Augie. That's what 99 years means. You have no friends now. They all want you for the gold. What gold? The gold you stole on your last job. The gold you got hidden away. Everybody knows about it. Cops, crooks. They all hunt you down for the gold. You stay here because it's the only place you're safe. Anybody ever tell you you talk too much, Pop? But even here, how long can you be safe? You're scared stiff. Some mobsters will come in and bust you out. You better shut up. I can give you the one thing money can't buy. Yeah. What? What you need. A hideout. A hideout? That's right. A place where you'll be absolutely safe and secure and comfortable. Where is it? Where? Huh. Well, that's... That's hard to say. Come on, where is it? Right now, it's in my cell. What are you talking about? Hey, wait! Okay, pull it on the door! What are you pull talking it. about, Pop? You'll see. I'll bring it here tomorrow afternoon. Bring what? Your hideout. How can you bring it? Okay, hideout? there's no more talking. Button up and that means everybody! <laughs> You can sit down, you can smoke. Hey, Pop. Hey, Pop. You come on over here. Oh, good afternoon, Hoggy. Yeah, well, what was uh, What was that line you was handing me yesterday? Well, I, I promised you a hideout. Huh? I have it here with me. In this little bottle. See? This little white powder. Pop, you know you're crazy. And you have enough of this powder to last through eternity. Almost. You've been in stir so long, you finally blew your lid. You have no idea how long I've been in stir, Augie. Add it up here and there, each time, each each lifetime, I'd say about 950 years. What? I think that's some kind of record. 
Listen, Pop, just beat it, huh? Why don't you believe me? A guy says he's done 950 years in jail, and he wants to know why I don't believe him. Oh. This powder, Orky. You take several grains of this powder... Oh, yeah, yeah. ...and yeah. your body will... Well, it, it goes into a, a state of suspended animation. That's the modern term. She called it a trance. She? She? Who are you talking about? Yes, it's at least 2,600 years ago. But I'll never forget her. Oh, for crying out loud. I never knew her name. She was a priestess in the Temple of Apollo at Delphi. And she fell in love with me. Hey, Pop, Pop, you, you know the sun's getting hot out here. Maybe you ought to get in. Anyhow, you, you swallow a few grains and you go into a deep trance. And when you come to or wake up, it's hundreds of years later. And it's a new world, a new society. Nobody knows you. Nobody wants you. You start life all over. Oh, rave on. Now, now make plans to break out, Augie. Quickly before they come for you. Go get your gold. Sure, get the gold. And then where do I hide? Oh, you crazy old nuts. You promised me a hideout. You me. haven't been listening, Augie. You can hide anywhere. A secluded spot, a, a cave, a forest, a, a desert. Yeah, great. And what do I do for chow? I'm trying to explain this, Augie. You don't eat. You don't drink. You don't have any wants. You, you have no needs. You're oblivious to cold, to heat, to rain, to, to snow. And in several hundred years, you come alive again. But how can you go... Augie, don't question. What do you mean, don't The question? ancients, they lived close to the gods. All the gods. Those were the days of marvels and miracles and wonders. Today, we don't believe anymore. So we use science to try to duplicate what the gods... Never mind all that. Just tell me, Pop. If this is such a hard item, how come you ain't using it, huh? Oh, I have. Yeah? Many times. Well, I was a galley slave in Greece, a gladiator in Rome. I was in the Tower of London, the Bastille. No matter how I tried, no matter how many times I started fresh, I always wound up in prison. Well, wouldn't you have enough brains to, to learn? No, Augie, and you won't have enough brains either. Once a jailbird, always a jailbird. Oh, I'm sick of it. I, I haven't been able to stay out of jail for over... 2,500 years. Huh? All I want to do now is... is die. Guys like you and me, Augie, we never learn. Okay, break it up! Fall in! Augie... Let's go! Remember, I'm not a nut. Uh, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. When your time comes, just go somewhere. Take a few grains of that powder. Uh, yeah, yeah. Guard that powder with your life, Augie. Uh, it's your race in the hole. Well, good morning, Augie. Uh, I hope you slept well. Uh, what do you want? Better get that cell all cleaned up. All right, all right. There's a new guard taking over my post. So? I'll be on the rear gate. None of you guys is a bargain. Oh, you'll miss me, Augie. The new guy reported in this morning. His name's Castle. You think he's tough? What else you got on your mind? Oh, I think you were a friend of Pop. Who said I was? He died last night. Yeah. Was that all you can say? Yeah? He left you his fortune. What fortune? Here it is. Well, take it. Hey, what's this? Eh, I don't know. I asked the warden's kid. You know the smart one that goes to high school? He says it's an ancient Greek coin from, uh, I don't know, what's the name of that place? Uh, that, Delphi, something like that. I don't know. Tell me, Augie, how does it feel to inherit a fortune? <laughs> hey, hey, you know this door. Bring it up, bring it up. Hey, what do you punch like this? There's a town hall meeting. Start walking. So, uh, not you. You're Augie Carroll, huh? And you're the new screw, huh? 
a little tap across the gut. I also got one that'll knock your teeth out. Yeah, you figure you're pretty good with that club, huh? Well, you could find out the hard way. You figure you're tough, don't you, Castle? Mr. Castle to you, punk. <sighs> See what you want. This is a penitentiary. So? You know what that means. It's a place where you do penance. Have you been doing any penance, Augie? Okay, Castle, what's your game? I want you to call me Mr. Castle. Yeah, what else you want? I want you to think about your sins, Augie. <laughs> think about them and repent. <laughs> Okay, you got ten minutes. Sit down. Smoke. He was wrong, wasn't he, Augie? Oh. The man that wrote stone walls do not a prison make, nor iron bars a cage. You know better than that, don't you, Augie? What's on your mind, Castle? You must have been one of those slow learners in school. Oh, I you. guess these days they call them underachievers. Why do you want? I want you to call me Mr. Castle. Yeah, well, what's on your mind, Mr. Castle? You're on my mind, Augie, yeah. night and day. Yeah? Why? Let's... Let's go talk to the warden about it. Hey, hey, wait, wait. What, what are you charging me with? I'll think of something. Hey, all you guys. You guys. You, you witnesses. I'm being framed. Hey, uh, Shut up, punks. Now, Mr. Augie Carroll, start walking. <laughs> Officer Castle and one prisoner headed for the warden's office. Walk through, Augie. Quick, Augie, dug in here. What? Do as I tell you. What's the big idea? Shut up. We'll head this way. This ain't the way to Walton's office. What do you care? You don't want to go there anyhow. That's where we headed. Out. Out. Out where there's booze and girls and two-inch steak. What are you talking about? We're headed for the rear gate. Hey, wait a minute. Right now, there's only one guard. Hold it. You mean you don't want to go? Why am I getting into Castle? My name isn't Castle. Why you mean your name isn't Castle? And I'm not a prison guard either. You want to... Hey... Who? What are you? That's a pretty good question. You must admit, so far, our tale is replete with people who are not what they seem. For instance, old-timer convict Pop claimed to be a Greek galley slave. And here we have prison guard Castle suddenly disavowing his identity. Well... At least you can depend on me to come back shortly with Act Two. Well, you know what's been happening to Augie Carroll, a hoodlum presently resident in one of our state institutions. First, an old and apparently half-insane convict gives him a vial containing a powder which can put a man to sleep for several centuries, or so he claims. Now, Augie is being conducted to the rear gate of the prison by a guard who has just revealed he isn't a guard at all, but someone who is going to help Augie escape. Even a mental genius would have trouble grasping at the significance of all these events. It's no wonder, then, that Augie insists on stopping short to think things out. Well, well, what do you mean? You, you ain't a real guard. That's it, Augie. How'd you get that uniform? How'd you get in here? It's a long story, but right now we only have time for a short one. Well, start talking. Let's talk about a hundred little blocks of pure gold. Each block weighs exactly one pound. So? So you freelance that one, Augie, and the big guy wants his piece. My deal with him was I could operate on my own, too. I don't owe him nothing, but this was his idea, Augie, to spring you. It's worth a piece, isn't it? What's he want? Fifty percent. No dice. Okay, Augie, stay here. Keep a hundred percent of nothing. What's the matter? Lose your nerve? You afraid to bust out? I ain't afraid of nothing. Well, do we go or do we stand here in the corridor much longer? Okay. Okay, we go. Start walking. How'd you get in here? You know the big guy. He has friends everywhere. He can find out if some guy's being transferred like a prison guard. There was a guard named Castle. He was coming here from way downstate. Well, he never made it. How do we get out the rear gate? Just up ahead, the door. It's open. Walk out. Now turn left. A rake is leaning against the wall. Pick it up. 
Start raking leaves. You follow this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Work your way slowly, very slowly toward the gate. I'll be talking to the guard. I'll hold his attention. Get behind him. Cloud him. Here, take this blackjack and make sure of him. What's the matter? I don't know how to sap a guy. Test if it's clean and we don't have to shoot. Now, here's the door. Walk out. Slow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well, well. Look at who made the cleanup detail. Big Augie himself. Yeah. We're going to show this punk how the other half lives. Get working on those leaves before I start working on you. Yeah, you know, Castle, I've been watching you. Oh, have you? Yeah. You're going about this job dead wrong. Am I? You can't treat these men like animals. Why not? That's exactly what they are. Now, you're brand new on the job, Castle. Now, let me give you a few tips. You think you know all the answers, huh? I don't know any of the answers. But I do know that for eight hours a day, we're just as much in jail as they are. So, why not just try to live together? Now, give a guy a break and... And never, never do what we're doing now. What's that? Never let a con get behind you. Hey! Hey, let's just plug him! Uh, uh, rear gate! Rear gate! Uh, uh, Run for rear it! Gate. Hey. Yeah. Rear gate! There's the car. Get in the back. Hey. Hey, what's this? Uh, dame behind the wheel. Jump in and shut up. Get out of here, Jenny, fast. That box on the back seat. Slacks, sports shirt, change. Pass me a shirt and pants. Who's this dame? We need a wheel person, don't we? I never heard of a dame who could go... Woman's to... lib, Augie. A fantastic thing. Now, you always thought dames were only for having laughs with. <laughs> There's a million other great services they can perform. Ginny, stop the car. Augie, your jailbird suit and my uniform. Toss them behind those bushes out of sight. Yeah, that's it. Okay, good deal. Okay, get going, Ginny. Wait a second. Head back toward the jail. What's the matter, Augie? Changed your mind? Busting out of jails is something I know more about than anybody in the country. In two minutes, you'll have cars, motorcycles, helicopters heading this way after us. But who's going to bother with a car that's kind of loafing along toward the jail? So we pass the jailhouse, pick up the pike, and head south instead of north. Move out and go slow. Slow, you understand? She understands. And why don't she say so? What can I tell you? She just isn't a talker, that's all. <laughs> Looks like we lost everybody. So, now let's head for the gold. The gold, huh? That was a deal. We spring you, you get those little blocks of gold, and we split 50-50. We, the big guy, and you. And, uh, you and her... What do you get? Jenny and I are on the big guy's payroll. We get a salary every week. Is that so, Jenny? Yeah, she really don't talk, does she? Well, she's a very serious person. Very deep. She can't be bothered with trivia. Yeah? What does she talk about? Uh, it depends. On what? On whatever suits her mood at the moment. I don't like a dame that never opens her mouth. It may very well be, but uh, the fact is you don't have to like her, Augie. Sort of business. Let's head for the gold. Now? Augie, yesterday is dead. Tomorrow may never be born. All we can rest on and swear by is today. Okay, okay. Keep heading south. You heard the gentleman, Jenny. Yeah, how about if we stop for some chow, huh? Well, you can't risk being seen, Augie. We gotta eat. Oh, I guess... Jenny, that's a diner up ahead. Pull into the parking lot. I'll go in and pick up some food. Uh, Augie, you try to keep out of sight. This ain't the first time I've been on the land. <sighs> Augie? Huh? Well, what do you know? She talks. Listen, what gives with a dame like you? Never mind all that. I don't have much time. You don't have much time either. Yeah, why? He's going to cross the big guy. He is? Yeah, he wants all the gold for himself. He does? And where do you come in? The two of us. We're together. So what does he want to do? You take us to where it's hidden. He shoots you. We take the gold and leave the country. So? Why is that a bad idea? Oh, it's a great idea. It's got one thing wrong with it. It can't work. Why not? 
You know why not? You don't cross the big guy. Because if you do, there's no place in all the world you can hide from him. Uh, what does Castle, or whatever his name, say to that? Oh, he laughs. He figures he's pretty smart. Well, he went to college. Okay, okay. Well, why do you tell me all this for, huh? Because I don't want no part of it. I I want to get in wrong with the big guy. That's good thinking. It's, it's not like I didn't try to talk him out of it, but... I don't know, sometimes a guy just won't listen to reason. Yeah, I know. So, well, there's something he don't have to know. Yeah? What? You don't have to know that I'm giving you this little thirty-two revolver. Take it. Sure. Sure, thanks. Now, remember, you're safe till we get to the gold. And then... Look, you don't have to tell me what to do. You know, it's really a shame... He's so educated. He speaks so nice. Now, why would you ask a question like that, Augie? I mean, do you mean... Well, why would a a mug like me want to know about stuff like... uh, like trances? Yeah, that's right. Uh, Ancient Greeks and Romans? Well, I, uh... I've done a lot of reading in jail. Ah, you know, know you could read. Ah, you're so smart. But you're just a hood yourself. Why ain't you teaching college? There's not enough money in it. Yeah. So, so what about them ancient Greeks? Hmm? Well, there were legends, stories of magic, miracle healing, trances. The ancients knew many secrets. But all knowledge of them has disappeared. Maybe we're rediscovering those secrets through science. Huh. Yeah, that's what he's saying. Maybe what the gods reveal to the priests in the ancient temples, they uh, they now reveal to the scientists in laboratories. Hey, slow down, Jenny. Up ahead, uh, is that the country road where we're supposed to turn off? Yeah, it looks like it. Go ahead, Jenny. It's a bad road to travel at night. Yeah, yeah, but... Uh... It's like a rainbow, you know what I mean? There's a pot of gold at the end of it. You said there was a, a hut just off to the right. Yeah, yeah. Stop the car, Jenny. Maybe we passed it. <laughs> I, I, I don't see anything. You don't? Well, why don't you turn around and look? Hey, what the... I never like to shoot a guy in the back. Where'd you get that gun? Wait. Jenny... Jim. This is one of them times she got nothing to say. Listen, Augie. Now, now, listen. Maybe we could discuss... Sure, what... sure. But me, I always discuss things best with this. No! Well, that's one down, Jenny. What do you mean, one down? One down, one to go. But I... I saved your life. So I say thanks. Oh, but you can't. You can't kill I me. I can't? Why? Because you can't. You can't double-cross a big guy. Who says? You can't double-cross the organization. They'll hunt you down. They'll never find me. You can't hide. I got a place. Augie. Augie, look at me. Look, I... I'm not so bad to look at, am I? No, no, you're great. Then take me with you, huh? You wouldn't want to go with me, babe. I would. I would. I'll be gone a long time. I don't care. Want me to tell you how long I'll be gone? I said I didn't care. I'm going to be gone for three, four, maybe five hundred years. But I don't... What, what are you saying, Aki? I'm saying I'll be away maybe five hundred years. You, you're crazy. That's how it goes, Jenny. i got to say goodbye now. Don't show me. the die, as they say, is cast. Augie has reached and decided to cross his Rubicon. The vial of white powder is in his pocket. Now to pick up the gold, find some remote spot, and sleep, perchance to dream, for uh, three, four, five hundred years. We'll see how this all works out when I return shortly with Act Three. And now Augie has more trouble than any one person can handle. 
an escaped convict. He is urgently wanted and pursued by the law. Since he has a suitcase containing 100 pounds of pure gold, he is being avidly sought by the underworld. He also has a vial of white powder, the contents of which can enable him to go into a death-like trance for several hundred years, or so he has been told. But can he believe such a thing? And does he have an alternative? That white powder could be the answer. But uh, what if it's a phony? Suppose it's a poison. These are the thoughts that spin about in Augie's head as he drives along the road to... uh, Well, so far, to nowhere. We interrupt to bring you this latest bulletin. Killer Augie Carroll, who escaped from the penitentiary yesterday, is still at large. However, a spokesman for the authorities is confident that Augie will be captured. As the spokesman said, too many people want this guy. He'll turn up in a day or two, dead or alive. Yeah. And I can also turn up in three, four hundred years, too. How do I know Pop was on the level? Can I just take that powder and go out like a light? And come back just like that? Yeah, and if I can, what will it be like all the years from now? Yeah, maybe, maybe I can find a hideout. There's got to be somebody I can trust. Somebody. Not everybody's a rat. Jerry. Jerry, sure. Sure, Jerry. <laughs> Let me in quick. Why, sure. I need a place to cool out. Oh, sure, Augie. Only if... Only what? Well, only the cops will be sure to check here. So what? You're clean. You are clean, ain't you? Sure. So they got to take your word. You ain't seen me. Now, first thing I got to do is hit the sack. Just go in the bedroom. Uh, oh, let me take that suitcase. No. It looks heavy. Hey, keep your hands off it. Okay. Sleep as long as you like. And there's, uh, there's plenty of heat in the refrigerator. I, I'll see you later. Yeah, where are you going? I, uh, I'm i working tonight. The band's still playing at the Silver Slipper? Oh, yeah, sure, sure. We're in solid. Who got you the job? You did. And who staked you all their music lessons? You did. I just want you to remember what you said a long time ago. You said you'd never forget it. I haven't. Okay, beat it. I want to sleep. Uh, sure, Augie. Uh, I'll see you. Jerry. Yeah? Come here. Well, what is it, Augie? Hey, tell me, Jerry, what's this card? Card? I just seen it on the table. Oh. On the phone. Oh, oh, well, that card. Yeah, yeah, it says, uh, City Police Force Special Investigations. Sergeant Morton, private number 227 Uh, well, let's, uh... That's what? Uh... Ah, oh, the cops were here, Augie. Yeah? Well, you know, they'd be sure to come here. Yeah? And this cop, this uh, Sergeant Morton, he said to me, have you seen Augie? And I said, no. <laughs> and he said, well, if uh, <clears throat> if you hear any news at all about Augie, just call us at this number. He left the card. And, 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 and were you going to call him if I showed up? Augie, how could you even ask me such a question? Were you, Jerry? Never, Augie, never. And why did you keep the card? Well, uh, you know how it is. I just... Why did you keep the card, Jerry? Well, you know, look, the guy, he he just left it and... If you wasn't going to use it, why did you keep it? Augie, Right here, right next to the phone. Andy. Augie, will you listen? And all you got to do while I'm fast asleep is make one little phone call. The cops get me, and you get all gold in the suitcase. Right, Jerry? Augie, please. You shouldn't have kept the cards. Augie, oh, Augie, you've got to listen to me. You, you you don't believe that I'd ever call the cops? Oh, I know that you never call the cops, Jerry. Augie, don't. Please, you can't. You can't. <sighs> you can't even trust your own brother. What a world. <laughs> Escaped convict, Augie Carroll, has been traced to Mountain City. He is armed, he is dangerous, he is vicious. Spokesmen for the authorities are confident his recapture is a matter of hours. Ah, shut up. (sighs) Maybe, maybe I better 
hole up someplace and take that powder. Ah, but that's it's crazy. It's got to be crazy. Pop had to be crazy. How can you just take a... Wait. Wait a second. Maybe... Maybe I could get a deal on a big guy. Maybe. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's me, Augie. Yeah. Never mind where I'm at. Now, just tell me. What kind of deal can we make? Why do you mean 75%? Castle or whoever he was said 50. Yeah? Yeah, come over just like that, huh? And how do I know I don't get bumped off the minute I walk in, huh? Tell me. How do I know? <sighs> what am I gonna do now? What? Here. 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 Yeah, right here. Right by these rocks. Yeah, nobody. Nobody could ever find me here. Hey, All I got to do is take this powder. And then I, I, I wake up, it's hundreds of years from now, and I got the gold, and I can start all over, and, and I got it made. I just take the powder. And it looks like I took a powder into the future. Well, here goes. Yeah, no. No, yeah, don't taste too bad. I better try some more. I want to be gone a good long time. years later the car should be a heap of rust but I ain't and my clothes they should be rotted away but they're still brand new you know oh so the powders are phony oh. how could such a crazy thing work yeah, I can stay here and die. Or I can go back to jail. Augie? Hmm? Augie? What? Augie, give me a lift back, please. You? Well, you're, you're, you're Jenny. Yes. Well, you, you can't be Jenny. I, I killed you. I, I, I killed you. Yes. You killed me. You're dead. Oh, I've been dead for... It must be 800 years. 800 years? You took a lot of that powder, Augie. Well, if, if you're dead 800 years, where, 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 where'd you come from? I've come from out of your head, Augie. Huh? They found me inside your head. They? Yeah. Well, who, who, who's they? They? 
the schoolmistress and her people. They found me and Castle and Pop and Jerry and the jail and the gold. They looked inside your head, Augie, and they found it all. No, 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 you ain't my head. You're real. I didn't kill you. You did, Augie. You did. I must have missed. Well, I won't miss this time. Don't shoot me, Augie. This time I'll make sure of you. You'll only follow up my circuits, and I'll have to go to the repair shop, and the mistress will be angry. This time... Augie, we're due back at the jail for another performance, dog. Oh, Augie, why did you do that, you... What the... Huh. Well, you, you, you ain't real. You're nothing but a... But a doll. You ain't real. Augie. Huh. Well, who are you? You know very well who I am. I am the schoolmistress, Helena. Yeah? And you must come back to the cage. Where am I? I realize you're a member of a lower order of life with an undeveloped mentality. But still you could try to learn. But I don't understand. I don't know. You are the only remnant of a primitive race that once inhabited this planet. What are you talking about? Whether you kill yourselves off by war or disease or some other stupidity... Hey, listen. ...or whether all of you simply left this planet taking all your records with you, we shall never know. But you are the sole survivor. In your head, we can read the only clues to your race that remain. This ain't happening. It can't be happening. You had two classes of people as we reconstruct your thoughts. Those in prison... And those outside. Look, 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 it's a gag, huh? Tell me it's a gag. Those in prison always try to escape. Those outside always tried to bring them back. That was the business of your society. But I ain't done nothing to you. And so, you must go back to prison. But why? You must go back so that you may escape again. But if I'm going to escape, why do I You have will to... spend what remains of your life escaping... And being recaptured. Why, why, why? So that our children may study you and examine the workings of a lower order of life. Hey, hey, hey. I got all this gold. Let's make a deal. Gold? We notice you have some in your teeth. Is that what it was used for? And why do you carry such a huge extra supply? Come, Augie, it's late. I'll give you half. You will go back to prison. Pop will give you the powder... Castle will help you escape. You will kill Castle, Ginny, and Jerry. Once again, you will wake up here. And you will go back to prison again and again and again. As they say, there is no armor against fate. Poor Augie. Condemned to eternal escape and recapture. But isn't that everyone's fate? Don't we strive to escape our faults? And aren't we constantly being recaptured by our weaknesses? Let me recapture you in just a few moments. And so, Augie Carroll... Can you imagine? Augie turned out to be the sole survivor of the human race and the only repository of our accumulated culture and wisdom. And it was from Augie that another race received its entire concept of our civilization. A bum rap for mankind, you say? Well, suppose you were the only survivor. What could be learned from you? From me, you can learn that we'll be here again with another mystery. Our cast included Leon Janney, E.V. Juster, Robert Maxwell, and Earl Hammond. 
The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Now, a preview of our next tale. Artie, you sounded just like Handsome Harry. I am Handsome Harry, sweetheart. Just using Stupid's body for a while. You... You are using Artie's body? Until I learn how to materialize, if I ever do. They tell me on the other side, in that limbo joint, it takes a lot of patience and practice. Yeah, what do they know? They even told me I'm getting this hate out of my soul the wrong way. Well, I haven't wanted to say anything. All right, so uh... don't. They say taking out my hate on Tex and Dory make my hate grow bigger. Said I gotta find forgiveness in my heart. I told him to take a powder. I know what I'm doing. I hope so. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. <laughs> <laughs> 